Okay, good evening everybody. Um, welcome to this evening's Overview and Scrutiny Committee meeting. I'm Councillor Paul Osborne and everybody else is here, almost. Um, first item on the agenda, minutes. Do I have your authorisation as Chairman to sign the minutes of the two meetings? Uh, one held on the 22nd of January and the other on the 19th of February as a correct record of those proceedings? Great, thank you very much. <laughs> Apologies and substitutions. What have we got you? So we have apologies from Councillor Pearce, who was going to be standing in as the substitute for the vacancy we currently have, but he has another meeting he has to attend to tonight. Okay, thank you. And I have apologies, well not necessarily apologies, I have joining uh, online Councillors McKirk, Councillor Maynard and Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, but you are there, I can see you all, so no getting away with it. Um, and everybody else is present. Yep. Uh, additional agenda items, there are none. Um, disclosure of interest and dispensations. To receive any disclosures by members of disclosable pecuniary interests, other registrable interests, non-registrable interests in matters on the agenda, and the nature of any interest and details of any dispensations obtained, Members are reminded to, of the need to repeat their declaration immediately prior to the commencement of the item in question. And the previous statement was a lot easier, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Uh, Councillor Byrne. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I am declaring um, the, my member of Battletown Council as a non-registrable interest. Okay. Yeah, which item? Um, item nine. Grounds maintenance, yep. Okay. Councillor Cook, probably the same? Yes, please, as Chairman of Battletown Council. Councillor Creaser, same as a potential. Yes, yep. sorry, thank you. Okay, Councillor Barnes. Yeah, it's similar here. I'm chairman of Playden, but there's nothing to do with Robert District Council in Playden at all, I don't think. <laughs> Um, Councillor Cooper. Um, yeah, uh, Settle Skim and Westfield Parish Council. Okay, thank you. Same answer, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Maynard. Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think I'll just make my usual declaration that I make for the purposes of transparency as much as anything else is to say I am an, a, an executive member of East Sussex County Council. Um, I, I've looked through the agenda. I can't see there's anything where I'd have to declare either a non, non prejudicial or a prejudicial, certainly not a prejudicial interest, but a, simply a, uh, sorry, a pecuniary interest. We will get it right one day. You'd think we'd know what we were doing by now, wouldn't you? A personal interest um, as an executive member, I don't think it's anything more than that. If, if people start to talk about East Sussex County Council, if you allow me to jump in, and then obviously I'll declare the interest as appropriate at that time. Thank you. Okay, right on. Councillor Timby. Yeah, sorry, do I have to declare as well as I'm here? No? <laughs> as a Bexhill Town Councillor, I would assume if, if you feel the need, then if you want well, to cover your yeah, back. Yeah, because it's going to come up in the um, grounds maintenance and uh, Bexhill Town Council, but also Old Town Occasions Limited. Okay, thank you. Is that it? <laughs> okay, right. Item five, performance report, third quarter. Uh, what have we 
got here resolved. Um, yeah, this is Anna. Resolve the overview of scrutiny committee, consider these findings and recommend any actions to Cabinet as necessary. Anna, over to you. Thank you very much. Nice to see everybody. Um, so I'm going to introduce the performance report and we have got some service managers online um, to answer any specific questions that I can't answer. There are three areas that I just want to bring to everybody's attention. Performance is looking very good across the board and you'll see from the appendix that I've attached that we've got lots of greens but we have three areas where we've got an amber rating, which means that we're monitoring it closely because the performance isn't quite where we'd like it to be. So the first one that I'd like to bring your attention to is the freedom of information requests. You will see that we've got a target to um, complete all of the FOI requests um, within 20 working days, and we're currently running a bit below that for quarter three at 89%. The, um, the target, as you know, we've proposed, well, actually will be changing to 100% in the next financial year. But for this quarter, I've put some um, words in there uh, by way of a narrative to explain what's happened this quarter. We had 13 FOIs that took 20 or more days to respond to because they were quite complicated. And although this is under target, it is within the, um, in accordance with Section 10 of the Freedom of Information Act because we requested additional time. The other interesting thing to note is out of the 151 requests received in quarter three, which obviously is quite considerable, and is actually 18% higher than the amount of requests that we received in quarter three this time last year, there have been several customers who've made multiple requests, and this adds to the time to respond um, often because of increased complexity and legal involvement. Uh, so all that information is also contained in the narrative um, and the appendix to the report. Are there any questions on that aspect before I move on? Yeah, um, uh, yeah Vic, Vicky, if you want to kick off. Thank you. I'm very aware of um, how much time our democratic services and other officers put in to dealing with all of this. And we are concerned about the vexatious nature of some of these repeated requests and multiple requests. Um, one thing we wondered was, um, if, if it's not too much trouble, if we could have a little breakdown of what kind of areas these are coming. Are they coming at customer services, housing and homelessness, planning, waste disposal? I just think it might give us an idea. Um, so how we know how we can support officers, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, of course, and we've got that information. I think Mark Adams is online at the moment if you want to ask him any specific questions, or we can get that information sent out separately. Mark, I see you've got your hand up, so over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I was just about to echo what... Anna said in relation to um, this breakdown is available. I'm happy to provide that information um, and contain it within the next report. So for, for quarter three, I can circulate it to all members um, after the meeting, you know, following the meeting um, that can add to the, to the minutes. And then ongoing, we, we can include this breakdown in the, in the report going forwards. Yeah, I think that would be useful because what, how, do you know, Anna, Say for this last quarter, we've got 151. Is that so? If if I was to sort of go simple, I'm I'm a I just go I'm I'm a self-employed carpenter. I like simple. So so if if I if I times that by four, that's 600 a year. Is that is that about right? Yes, I believe so. Mark, have you got any figures for how many it equates to over the year? Um, uh, yes, it, it would be um, around the, the, the 600 mark. So it is quite a, a labour intensive um, feature. It's a statutory duty, so we've got no um, option but to, to, to carry out this function. But like I say, the, the complexity um, and, and the number of requests, um, particularly January, which will be in, in quarter four. But like I say, we, we, we have been um, hit by 
by a large number of, of FOIs of recent, and like I say, the, the, the measure is reflected in, in the performance. And is that, is that sort of average over the last five, six, seven years, or, or has there been a spike in the last couple of years or so? Do you know? Mark, are you able to answer that one, or is it unusual uh, activity for this time of year, or for this year? Um, look, looking at the, the, I suppose, peaks and troughs, it, it does vary. Um, the, 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 this particular quarter is higher than what we've seen compared to previous years. So it's potentially, you know, one of those influxes that we may receive from time to time. But like I say, I, I want to monitor it carefully, um, look at how it impacts o over the next um, few months. But like I say, yeah, it, it, it does look like there is a slow incline, um, but like I said, there is a spike for this quarter. But again, I, I can provide that information, that, that comparison to um, the last few years, just so members have a, a bit of a broader, broad, broader view um, of, of where, where you know, the, the requests are and our performance that's ongoing. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think, I think to be honest, the, the members are surprised at the level of FOIs, you know, if you take it down to sort of working days, it's more than two a day, you know, and, and someone has to deal with that. So there's a lot of work. I Thank you, Chair. Chair. Yes. Go on, Mark. Go on. Oh, thank you, Chair. Sorry to inter interrupt, but um, yes, it is um, becoming quite labour in intensive, and we we are having to look at resilience measures going forward to to be able to deal with this. Um, do, you know, if this trend does continue, so that's something that that is in a in a forward look and, and preparation has begun in relation to this. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, Councillor Burton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the other uh, very important aspect of analysing the content in principle which service area will be so useful because then we can also reflect and problem solve to see if there is some part missing from our side or parts missing to improve so that people don't need to resort to a freeze of information request to get their, their satisfaction and knowledge. Councillor Barnes, John. Yes, at what stage, we're told that we get repeated requests, so what stage does that, do we take legal advice, at what stage that becomes uh, vexatious? Because um, repeated requests implies that either we're not producing the information, or something is going wrong, or somebody's got an obsession. Thank you, Chair. I mean, we do certainly have the same residents submitting requests a lot. That certainly happens. And there'll be a follow-up, you reply, there'll be a follow-up, another follow-up, and it, and it goes on. I mean, Mark's probably got a better idea. When, when they reach me, it tends to be the complex ones. Um, and we can do that. We can take action. Um, and we are looking at that in some cases. It's, it's getting too much for us to resource. Yeah. Mark, you want to come back? Um, yes, it's just a follow up from um, look what, what Lorna said. Um, there, there is um, legislation that allows us to look at um, the, the nature of the request. You know, that there's, there is protection within that to say, you know, it's manifestly unreasonable to fulfill the, the request. Um, some of the requests also carry a, a public interest test as well. So, you know, we, we have to make sure that, you know, each um, the, each one of the, the FOIs is scrutinised. Um, and like I say, where, where it becomes unreasonable, then, you know, we, we have that legislation to, to back it up. Thank you. Um, I didn't see you indicated. Did I, Councillor Legg? No, no. I've got one online and I've got... Um, Councillor Bayliss, so I'll, I'll take Simon. Simon, you're next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just to say, um, 
there's the 18 hour rule of course so if an foi is going to take longer if that's still in place which i believe it is if an foi is going to take longer than 18 hours to service that can make it you know unreasonable um and it, you know i think it's quite a common experience now across public sector uh sort of vexatious and repeated fois um there's just more and more of them and um i would certainly support i can't obviously can't speak for other members but i would i would i would certainly support us taking a robust line with vexatious uh, fois and uh, if i think if we've got a clear policy um and if it's, it's a de defensible policy then um you know we can we don't want to be not to be transparent of course it fois are there for a reason but it's you know it, it takes up a resource it can be vexatious it's part of a pattern across the public sector at the moment and, and i would certainly support us being robust in our response okay thank you um councillor maynard your hands up indeed thank you very much chairman just to say in terms of obviously it's a national requirement and required by law in terms of responding to fois i just wondered is there an opportunity when we have the initial res initial response to an foi um and I'm, uh, in terms of how we how we engage with those residents because i don't think um we've talked about um, other members have talked about vexatious fois but i don't think clearly all are some are some some are very sim simple questions but i do understand obviously some are very detailed inquiries that that require some work but why i raise that is because we could encourage if it was allowed um encouraging people to contact their local member um so that you know in terms of that open and transparent route because quite clearly a local member can often access those answers for them um relatively in a relatively straightforward fashion if it's in fact a straightforward question but of course i do understand that with some people um if they don't like the answer they will ask the question once again but i just thought that was worth that point was worth making thank you yep good point um councillor bayes yes thank you um i i um um, a couple of the points that I wanted to make have already been picked up in relation to the number of hours, which I think would be quite interesting. I mean, I, I wonder also about um, making charges for some of the F uh, for FOI. So if, it take, so if the hours exceed a certain limit, you can actually charge, and we ought to be, we ought to be looking at that. And you know, where you've got somebody who's deliberately s submitting, say, four freedom of information respects, a, a request to get round that charging argument, uh, we, we should be uh, very aware of that. The other point I would make is about publication schemes. So a lot of authorities actually publish. So when they have asked a question um, on FOI, they actually publish the information that they've given. Um, and that means that when you then get a follow-up or a similar request, you can then point the person to, the, to your website, to the uh, list of FOI information that you've sent out. Um, and, you know, that's it. That's FOI dealt with. Uh, and I just wonder if we're missing a bit of a trick on that. Good point. Good point. I'm assuming you're listening to that, Mark. <laughs> Go on. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it, it, it's a, a really valid point. Um, the our, our publication, we are duty bound to, to publish um, them. You know, our responses. Um, you know, annually. We also are looking at some of the um, frequently asked uh, FOIs um, that we can signpost so that this side of things is, is, is under review so we do get um, you know a lot of requests from you know, subjects on you know freedom of the land um, and what you know where you know it, it's it's a way that we can say well if you go to this part of our website you'll be able to see this information here it's already it's already been asked and, and we can respond that way so that, that's something that we are looking to improve but um something that that's definitely we will we, we'll look to take forward too 
Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, I will mention the uh, the dashboard you've made, the the sort of coloured page and the data in pie charts, as I would call them, and and the calls answered and the percentages and everything else. So uh, I think that makes it easy reading, doesn't it? So, um, so yeah, we like that. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, some of the figures are, yeah. Total contact, 10,633. Emails, 1,469. Resolution, 86%. So, a lot goes on, doesn't it? <laughs> Anybody got anything else? No? All happy? Anything else, Anna? Or you? Yeah? There was just a couple of other areas I wanted to mention to everybody. Um, areas that we're just monitoring. The next one is the telephone calls answered by customer services, which is the sum of the received and the abandoned calls. So this is quite a, a strange one because we're looking to channel shift towards the digital offer, as I've mentioned before. And in this measure, you'll see that we actually had 26% more calls received in, in quarter three compared with quarter three last year. I think there's an error in that. It should be quarter three this year compared with quarter three last year. Um, we actually answered more calls, um, but uh, it, of course it didn't um, evidence a channel shift towards digital. So as you can see, as I put in, in paragraph 13, it indicates an improvement in performance because we answered more telephone calls, but not a reduction in the calls presented. However, which is the strange bit, if you look at KPI C5, which is the total number of customer contacts to the council that you just mentioned, Chair, it does show an increase in digital contact at 55.83% um, versus the traditional contact at 44.17%. We're just getting a lot more contact, uh, contact it seems. Difficult, wouldn't it? <laughs> Councillor Clark. Yes, I wanted to answer, if that's okay, a couple of questions on the housing part of this agenda. Um, one was, it's very difficult, difficult to categorise figures like um, average cost of placing households, temp accommodation, amount of days before they're placed, because um, every case is, is unique in some ways. I'm aware of one case that I'm um, involved with where the person has had three temporary accommodation addresses. So that's a difficult to categorise as a figure. And um, because of complex issues with his application, she's concerned about child's education, so a couple of placements she offers are not acceptable. So her stay in temporary accommodation is quite long, almost a year, and the cost for this authority, but it's just that one first one, one family around about forty thousand quid. So it's very complex, very, very difficult. And um, and also the, the charges, the, the placements and, and costs of putting in term term accommodation vary from depends on what you, you can access. You know, it might be one might be high. So when you're trying when you're saying there's an average, there is, but there's a high and a low, you know, that's what I'm gonna say. Councillor Timpy. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, may I just ask about the three and a half thousand odd calls abandoned? Um, it says the average ab abandonment time was 5.41 minutes, but the average call wait is 5.58 minutes. So you would, it would seem to me people are quite impatient. Um, but what happens with those abandoned calls? I mean, are, we, are they recorded so that you know who and do you call them back? Or what, what happens to them? I would say that might sound like me ringing someone. <laughs> You've got about a minute <laughs> and now I quit and <laughs> try someone else. <laughs> Mark, I suppose you've got an answer that's better than mine. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, sadly, um, we, we, we aren't able to, at the, at the moment to take a proactive stance and 
you know, review the data in real time in, in relation to the abandoned calls and look at steps we can to, to call these customers back um, in, a, in an ideal world. Yes, that would be the, the perfect solution or there would be um, work around our phone system that enables customers to, to, to if they don't want to wait that long, they could select a callback. So some of those features are coming. It's, it's just going to take a bit of time. But um, sadly, like I say, we, we, we're not able to proactively review that list and um, look at, you know, if, if they've managed to get through, managed to contact, you know, we, we do try and prioritise um, calls from, from the most vulnerable, so particularly the housing side. Um, you know, those calls should have priority to come through. Um, you know, five minutes or, you know, or just under six minutes isn't that long to wait for, for an abandoned call. Um, so it, it, it's just try, like I say, trying to weigh that side of it up. Um, you know, these are averages, so there are going to be cool wait times that, you know, hit sort of 50, 50 minutes or so. But like I say, we, we are performing as best we can to, to get to the, these calls. But, um, you know, it, it's a difficult, difficult thing to, to, to do with the resource we have in terms of that proactive response. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Mrs Barnes first, and then I'll go to John. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Chairman. Um, my question really is, what happens on the line as they're waiting? Do they get a message to say, hang on, we'll be with you in a minute? Or what, you know, one, one is familiar with that. Um, and how many people are actually receive, you know, um, at the receiving end of the phone calls? Are we, are we down on the numbers of people to answer the phone? I'm going to introduce Mark again. Go on in, Mark. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair, if I, if I may answer for you. So in, in terms of the call weights um, experience, so um, the, the customers are uh, periodically advised, um, you know, we, we, we know you're waiting. You know, we, we're trying to deal with as many calls as we can to get through to you. So you know, every, every three minutes or so, there is a proactive message that does um, prompts on the system, um, you know, then it, 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 it depends on what call queue you use. So if you phone council tax um, or if you phone the waste side, you know, we try and proactively promote channel shift. So it might be a case that, you know, one of the messages says, you know, did you know you can you know, pay your council tax online um, or you can use our telephone service to do this. So um, again, we, we'd like to say try and help customers if, if they, they you know, don't await um, too long. Um, in, in relation to the number of officers, um, it does vary. Um, we are we try to wait our staff based on on peak times, based on trends from you know what we know. So like you know, Mondays are, are particularly a heavy day, so we, we're better resourced on a Monday. And again, that that um, you know that dynamic um, way of resourcing, um, we 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 do try to to seat where possible. Um, you know, we, we have to look at the whole year right, for our staff. So we, we can't just say, you know, all oh, that we've got a really busy period coming up. Let's bring loads of staff in. We have to budget and seat our, our contact centre based on you know, that, that, that full year side of things. Um, the, in, in terms of officer, we, we are down one full time post. That, that's the, the only um, shortage that we have um, due to, to, to yeah, a, a natural attrition. Okay, um, we've been on this one for half an hour, so uh, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I, Mark's answered one of my questions. Yeah, but the other one is, can we use developments in AI to try and um, analyse the list of calls and get some kind of callback system going, or is that still too far off? I think we've got something called Amy. We have. We have. Mark knows a little bit about Amy, I suspect. Um, so, so we are we are trying to um, look at modernisation. Um, so our, our our phone contracts, um, we we are in a, an extension period. So we will be looking at um, all the features that we 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 you know modern systems should have, you know, like call waiting. Um, you know, callback requests, knowing where you are in the queue, 
um, you know, there, there are opportunities to look at um, analytics for AI, so where people can interact, you know, via, via you know, uh, natural language processing, so someone can actually, you know, if we aren't able to digitize someone, we can perhaps look at a traditional channel that's digitized. So, you know, for example, MISBIN, um, you know, it, it, it's quite, quite a logical process, and that potentially could be um, looked at as a, an AI solution. Um, it's just balancing that with cost. Um, at the moment, it wouldn't be viable because our misbin performance is very, very good. You know, we, we're you know, less than 60 a month. Um, and in, in terms of the, the cost of the, the development, it, it, yeah, it, it's not, not a viable option. But, but like I say, there are uh, further routes that we can take. Like I say, our chatbot um, does use um, natural language processing. It does incorporate some of the latest technology with chat GPT. Um, to provide an answer, and it also scans our website to provide customers with as um, best answer as possible in terms of if they ask a question, it it will be as 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 much as realistic as possible. But you know that you are speaking to a bot; and it's not a human. Um, and there are questions that we will signpost to call us that we don't feel is appropriate for a bot to answer. So if someone says, I'm homeless, I've got nowhere to stay, the the bot will automatically say, you need to phone us. We need to, you know, you need, we, we can only do with that call, that inquiry via phone, because I, I, I wouldn't want to look at an automation route for someone on, on that homeless side of things. Yep, that's sensible. Um, Councillor Cooper, got your hand up. Just a, a quick one on data, really. If you request a callback, is that then classed as an abandoned call or not? Well, there's a question. Mark's smiling. He's not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, technically, no. Um, it, you know, some some contact centres um, look at divisive ways to. What, what they count as a, an abandoned call or not, um, it, it it depends how the architecture of the system would be created. So I wouldn't, if someone requests a callback, I wouldn't want that being counted as an abandoned call. Technically, it is, but it, it's it kind is. of not really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's just we, we're something we need to build into our, our new system once we get it. But you know, that's something to watch because, like I say, I wouldn't want that that to be treated. But I know many companies. Know, do do things differently. Okay, thank you. Okay, right, thank you. Um, we have the recommendation here is resolved that this committee consider these findings and recommend any actions to cabinet as necessary. Do we have any actions to recommend to cabinet, or have we sort of given enough minute that they can action themselves, Councillor Barnes? On that first one. Um, I do think we need to explore the possibility of charging for some of the uh, complaints and uh, look also if there are repeated requests, whether they're vexatious. It, it, it does seem to me we probably need to up our game a little way. I'm told that management can look at that. That's, what, that's all you want. I, I, I don't care who looks at it, as long as somebody does. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so you're all happy with that then? Yes. Yep. Someone to move in second, I suppose? Councillor. I'm, I'm happy to move it. Um, yeah. And I'd appreciate it. I think all of us would, um, if when you've done your findings, um, Lorna, you could refer them back to us, because I think we like to see if there's anything we can do to continue to support the officers with, with these issues. Right. Yeah, and sec happily uh, seconded from Councillor Mary Barnes. All those in favour? That's good. That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, right. Moving on, item six, Crime and Disorder Committee to receive a report from the Community Safety Partnership. Um, this is on page 21. Um, purpose of the report to 
receive an annual report from the work of the Safer Rover Partnership and address the issues of antisocial behaviour, crime and community safety across Rover. Uh, our recommendation is make any recommendations arising from it and report to the Chair of the Safer Rover Partnership for consideration and the Council's work in relation to antisocial behaviour, crime reduction and community safety be noted. Um, we have online Chief Inspector Jay. I'll say Jay. I've got, uh, yeah, I've got Councillor Cooper and Councillor Maynard um, declaring interest, I assume, possibly. Absolutely. Um, I chaired it today. That I chair the uh, Safe Communities Partnership Board, which is Pan Sussex. So just to raise a personal interest in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cooper's turned her hand off, so I'm assuming that's a nothing. If not, shout. Um, Richard, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the annual report of the Rover Community Safety Partnership uh, to, to fill the Council's statutory responsibilities under sections 19 to 21 of the Police and Justice Act 2006, uh, which requires us to scrutinise the work of the Safer uh, Community Partnership annually. Uh, the report also includes information about the Council's own responsibilities and actions related to community safety and antisocial behaviour. Uh, just to remind members that Councillor Stanger was the uh, chair of the Safer Revival Partnership and he's also the co-chair of the joint uh, partnership that we have with Hastings. Uh, Councillor Drayson is the council representative on the board of the Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, I think the first thing to say is that we continue to have excellent working relationships with the police and the other agencies uh, that contribute to community safety. Uh, the Council operates a joint action group uh, with the Police, Southern Housing, East Sussex Park Enforcement and the Pelham. Uh, the JAG, as it's known, meets monthly to discuss community safety issues, uh, trying to resolve those issues in partnership, uh, agreeing who's going to take the lead uh, in different areas. Uh, paragraph 6 of the report sets out the JAG priorities for last this year, uh, which were antisocial behaviour and youth crime, uh, drug-related harm and rural crime. Uh, the, the JAG also uh, deals with uh, the items which are set out in uh, paragraph 8, um, which is obviously our, our usual for business as usual, uh, which is looking at cooking, uh, domestic abuse, high-risk and medium-risk antisocial behaviour, and all high, hate crime cases. Uh, we also look at modern slavery and road safety and there are professional meetings around safeguarding. Uh, paragraph 12 report highlights the priorities of the Safer Hastings Rover Partnership and that's our protecting vulnerable people, uh, making the streets and businesses safer and thirdly identifying those at risk of harm. Uh, the Council, Police and Social Housing Landlords regularly meet to discuss high risk cases uh, including high-risk victims at multi-agency risk assessment conferences. Uh, this year, the partnership delivered another successful white ribbon campaign. Uh, this year, it's focusing on the abuse and neglect of older people. The report sets out there has been a marked increase in shoplifting across Sussex, and we will be launching an online crime report tool for shops and businesses after Easter. Another significant area of work this year was the transfer of public-facing CCTV cameras uh, to Bexhill Town Council. There are 12 uh, CCTV cameras in Rover, 9 in Bexhill and Sidley, and 3 in Battle. The old BT landline cameras have all been replaced with new Wi-Fi cameras and the associated routers, and it is hoped that uh, Battle Town Council will assume responsibility for their three cameras in Battle. Uh, it being the norm in Sussex that the town councils operate CCTV cameras, although Sussex police are responsible for their monitoring. Uh, there is obviously a great deal of information in the report, and I uh, appreciate that you have a full agenda this evening. Uh, so I was going to suggest that if members have any particular items they wish to receive a briefing on, at, uh, it would more, probably be more appropriate uh, to advise me after this meeting, and we'll arrange a briefing at one of the member briefing sessions on a Thursday evening. 
Uh, finally, Chief Inspector Jay Mendes is in, on, in attendance online. Uh, he wishes to address the committee and answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, Chief Inspector, over to you. Uh, good evening, Chair. Good evening, Councillors. Um, so yeah, I can only reinforce what's already been said. Uh, we have an excellent working relationship, uh, and we, you know, we're determined to tackle crime, keep our communities safe, um, and, and we've had some really good, successful results. Uh, and I'd just like to touch on a few of those. So around ASB, um, we, we've had the issues uh, around Herbrand Her Walk. Uh, the removal of the unauthorised encampment. Uh, it's a really great piece of work, working with you know our local community and uh, the council because that was causing environmental damage. It was stopping the environmental work being carried out uh, around flooding. We've had long-standing neighbouring issues where we've worked jointly together, and recently we've been to Crown Creek Prosecution Service uh, and an authority charge on a number of them. We've got ongoing multi-agency approach in Sydney uh, with contentual safeguarding in Bexhill around Bowery Place. Uh, and this links in with the Department of Living Up. We've had some great success with um, rural crime. Uh, one of the bits of feedback we have from the rural communities around burglaries and the theft of plant machinery. Uh, so we've worked locally and also with joint forces uh, to target some of those most prolific offenders where we've seen a, a number of convictions. They are now in prison and we had Bob Spider, which was running to, to combat that, uh, along with our neighbouring forces, Ken, uh, the Met and Surrey. And so throughout that work, a number of people have been convicted now. So we've seen a real drop off in those burglary series. Uh, we've had a young man who's been quite a prolific ASB offender um, he's been charged with two burglaries and four thefts of motor vehicles. Uh, he's been remanded for three months, received a 15-month suspended sentence. Uh, again, one of the things that has increased is acquisitive crime around shoplifting. We are being really proactive around that. Uh, um, you know, prolific offender Sammy Evans was charged with two burglaries recently. A number of shopliftings resulted in the CBO. Again, some joint, you know, joint working there together in prison for three months. Uh, we still have priorities around domestic abuse, violence against women and girls. Uh, Max Wright, he committed five offences at Greg's Hill of sexual assaults on females, uh, and received seven years recently. And um, which is, you know, it, it was an instant where we identified him really quickly. A very short time frame where a number of uh, women were sexually assaulted and he was arrested and dealt with very quickly. So there's just a few bits that I want to touch on, but I'm I'm happy to take any questions around and um, you know the 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 current work and any other areas that so I might want to touch on. Okay, thank you very much. Um in the room first, uh Councillor Clark. <coughs> thank you, uh Chairman. Well, in respect, I actually wish to pay you a compliment because in the last four years, oh, don't laugh, I've dealt with three very nasty domestic violence and abuse cases in my ward. And um, after initial contact, and police were informed, the response from the police was absolutely excellent. I know you've got a dedicated teams for this now. Uh, first of all, all the locks get changed to increase the security of the person, even improve lighting and uh, and cameras and things. Um, what a lot of people may not know, because I've done a lot of research, you've got a very dedicated website that covers the issues of domestic violence and the support that's available to people. And um, um, I know you received the award some years ago for the work you've you done with uh, supporting people with domestic violence in Sussex. So I was very easy, very easy for me to step back once the police got involved, because I was, I was confident that they would support this person. And also... It is also an increasing number of men who have been uh, subject to domestic violence as well now. It's on the increase with men as well. So I'll start you off with a compliment. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was just going to confirm that you heard a compliment. So. <laughs> That's good. Um, what have we got online? I've got, oh, oh Councillor Barnes in the room. 
Councillor John Barnes. Yes, I begin with a compliment. Um, I, I do think actually the strengthening of PCSOs and the close working with parish councils is something uh, which we do need to pay tribute uh, to the local police. Uh, they've taken this back not quite to the level we enjoyed, I think, uh, pre the slump. Uh, but it's now actually working very satisfactorily as far as I'm concerned. Um, the two areas I'd like to hear a bit more about, and not necessarily at this meeting, but possibly afterwards, um, it troubles me that in shoplifting we now seem to have organised gangs uh, rather than individual shoplifters. And I wondered if this change in the scale of operation uh, necessitates a change in the approach by the police. The other area which you never hear enough about and where I would hope we're working very closely is um, preventing crime by actually ensuring that first-time offenders, when they come out of prison, uh, get help to get a job and the bit that we can do is get help to find accommodation. And I just would welcome some comment from that from our officer team and from the police because very often if a first-time offender after experiencing prison wants to go straight, the more help we can give them, uh, the better. Who wants to try and answer that one? Chair, yeah. yeah. I can uh, just in relation to the organised crime around shop victims, uh, we have a sort of serious organised inquisitive crime meeting each each month, and we look at the trends around organised crime. So we monitor it through the road networks, uh, our specialist teams, and we do identify any teams that are coming into Sussex around that, and, and we're very good um, at disrupting them. Uh, and we mainly do that via the road networks because you know, there's only certain routes into, to into our counties. Um, so AMPR, which recognises number plates. Um, so the more disruption we can do. So Sussex is not a highly targeted area for, for that type of crime because we have a real success disrupting that. Uh, and then coming on to people coming out of prisons, um, myself and um, the, the other group work really well together about housing, uh, people going into drug rehabilitation, getting support through mental health services and charities and so on. So that that is all looked at when people come out of prison, you know, rehabilitation offenders, um, and we do do a lot of work to try and um, divert people from crime so that they continue. Um, so that is one of our biggest aims to to stop that continuation of crime when they come out of prison. So it is it was it is all part of the process that we are we are kind of building into our working partnership. Good. Answer your question, John? Yep. yep. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Um Councillor McGurk, you're online, you've got a hand up, Simon. Thanks thanks very much. Yeah. Um hi Chief Inspector. I was um I also uh, compliment if I can start off with one, one of the and just in a couple of questions. Um, I've this, I, I'm, I'm councillor for Ryan Winchelsea, one of the two councillors for Ryan Winchelsea, um, and we've had a sort of bit of an outbreak of antisocial behaviour locally, um, and uh, I've had some really positive conversations with one of your PC and uh, a detective inspector as well locally about that about responding to that and I know they've been working with and liaising with uh, rather senior officers as well about how to manage some of that behavior and try and manage it out of the areas and there's been there has been a lot of sort of really proactive policing including an increase in visible policing in the area which has been really welcome um my questions were how how can we you know carry that on in a way i know rye is going to present some challenges to you we're on the edge of your policing area and obviously and you know understand absolutely that policing must be intelligence-led 
now in order to make the best use of, of limited resources. Um, but how can how can we do that effectively in Rye? And what might it look like? And also, the second question was about a year ago. You gave an interview to Rye News, and you were talking about um, looking at you wanting to you wanting to creatively use the police station in in Rye, which has been underused. Has has anything come of that, or is there anything that we can do to support? Um, uh, you know, the, the police station being used more creatively for a multi-agency response, whether it's to do with, you know, bond slavery or, um, you know, supporting women and girls or any sort of wider community cohesion stuff that, that would be, that might be useful in helping to suppress and divert people in the way that you were just talking about. So, your first question. Um, so, in relation to uh, the geographical area of what lies, if you ask, um, and as I've said at a lot of meetings, um, patrols, um, just seeing police officers on the streets um, is something of a luxury these days. Um, so, it's very much driven by demand. And the only way I can manage the threat, risk, and harm to the communities is being by, told by the communities what that uh, level of threat risk and harm is. So all I can say is that I try and encourage the communities to report to us uh, and yourselves to report problems, because if I don't know about it, I can't deal with it. Uh, and I, I would have hoped that you've seen over the last few years, um, when we've seen an emerging problem, the police effectively deal with it because we put plans in place, uh, we put more officers into that area, and we, you know, increase patrols and look proactively to deal with those offenders, whether to support them through the community or to, you know, through punishment of them being arrested and going to court. So that's kind of all I can really say is that if you have problems in your area, you really need to report them. Um, it's not an inconvenience for me to get lots of calls. It's more, it's more needed for me to build up a picture of where I need to put my resources. Um, so I, I'm glad that's kind of working in practice, and I would just encourage that uh, continues. Uh, in relation to Rye Police Station, uh, the future of Rye, it, it could be used more. It is used by a number of other agencies and services. But um, as you know, a member of Rye, if you want to have an event or you want something to happen there, you know, please get in contact with the local inspectors. Uh, we've had a number of events throughout of, of Hasting the Rye, you know, anti hate. Um, kind of events, uh, stuff around violence against women and girls, promoting support for victims of domestic violence. So if there is an event you'd like to do or you'd like to use the station, I'm more than happy for you to, you know, you to do that. Excellent. Um, I'll take you up on that. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, anyone else in the room? I've got Councillor Bayliss. Yes, thank you. And um, I, I, I'm sort of speaking here um, with my um, cabinet hat on around economic, economic development and regeneration. And I'd like to sort of start again by making a positive point that um, maybe if I'd been here a year ago, um, the, the, the issue that I'd have been talking about is antisocial behaviour in the town centre. Now, I know it hasn't completely gone away, but it's certainly not something that's raised with me on a, on the sort of regular basis that it was raised um, in, during the first term of being um, a, a rather district councillor. So I think that, again, is down to the um, use of PCSOs, and um, that's to be very welcomed. Um, now, the reason I am speaking is because um, I am... Um, or have been lobbied really hard by businesses um, in Rother, um, by, um, big, you know, our, we, we have one of the sort of largest independent supermarket chains with Jemsons. I've been um, lobbied by them. Um, I've, I've been lobbied by shop managers working in Bexhill about um, shoplifting. And it, it, reading this report, 87.1% rise in shoplifting is absolutely shocking. 
I believe. It's absolutely shocking. Um, I mean, I, I'm not speaking out of turn here. The manager at um, uh, the... Um, uh, at the co-op um, I spoke to yesterday talked about um, professional shoplifters um, and, a, and, and generally youth type crime um, occurring on a daily basis. Um, my son happened to be in co-op on Saturday evening um, and witnessed um, you know the most awful abuse of shop workers in there. The um, person that um, uh, runs um, a sort of cut price shop in St. Leonard's Road, told me that on a good week, they lose £500 worth of stock. On a bad week, it's £1,000 worth of stock is shoplifted. And it's shoplifted to order. Um, so, you know, I was really pleased to see that they, um, they were going to introduce the um, DISC system. I met... Um, with the uh, owner of um, Jepson Supermarkets, with um, Sally Ann Hart MP and um, Hugh Merriman MP, and we were quite confident this was, you know, before Christmas, we were confident that this would all be introduced in the new year, and I'm very disappointed to find that it's still not uh, gone live. I mean, the, you know, the... This is a, a, an issue which impacts on individual businesses, people's living. It Im impacts on shop workers who suffer horrendous abuse, some of which uh, some people have, have actually been assaulted, but they on the receiving end of abuse, and it, and it really impacts on people's mental health. And surely we can find £25,000 worth of funding and to get the disc system up and running in in um, in Robert and help our local businesses. Um, as I say, I, I'm speaking as as a portfolio holder who wants to support our small businesses. That's the backbone of our local economy in Rother District. Um, so that's I, you know, I. I I'm frustrated, terribly frustrated, that we seem unable to unable to sort of address this huge increase in in shoplifting crime um, and when you then look at the news and see that Sussex police have to make eight million pounds worth of savings in the next financial year and you, your heart sinks so it's a statement but also a sort of question really um, about can we make this a priority for the next for the next financial year? I don't envy a chief inspector oh, trying to answer that one. Um, oh, no. yeah. also, I think, uh, if I can leave Carol to talk to you about this, yeah, um, I'll just give you a little bit of context around shoplifting. Um, so we have seen a huge increase in shoplifting. And I would uh, attribute some of that to us encouraging shop owners to report crime. And the only way we can deal with prolific shoplifters is if the mass reported. But then we still have the issues around obtaining evidence. So we really do need businesses to work with us to provide a CCTV, to provide statements. Um, uh, and that is where we've fallen down in the past because we will get a report, but then we don't get any support and evidence that people are continuously getting away with crime um, time after time. Um, the, my, my team used to focus on five uh, of the most prolific, prolific offenders a month uh, in our hub intelligence meetings. Uh, we've now moved to one prolific offender, and in the last month, we've charged over 100 shop victims on Hastings and Robber and convicted five to six prolific shoplifters because we're now focusing on one person each time getting getting the support from the shops uh, and getting the charges to sneak us. So it is working and that method is working. And just to provide you a little bit of context, one of my PCSOs today, um, Neil Holden, he's just coming up to retirement and he spent 17 minutes chasing a prolific shoplifter around Sydney until a dog unit arrived and arrested her. 
Um, and I don't think I could have kept up, you know, and, and he's nearly 20 years older than me. <laughs> so my team's are dedicated and really trying to push and move forward with this. So hopefully, you know, just me telling you what's happening will give you some confidence. But uh, Carol will tell you about the, the DIS system, I believe. Um, yeah, just to say that there hasn't been any let up on the work on the DIS system. The reason that the DIS system is delayed is that we've been able to secure funding for a three year project, but there are delays in that funding being released. And I can't go into any more details around that, but we've gone from what would have been funded out of the Safer or the partnership budget for one year to securing three years worth of funding. In addition to that, we're working with the drug and alcohol services. Um, and we'll be working with colleagues in housing and other areas of the council to actually look at behaviour change on the back of the DISC reporting system. So the DISC information will provide a platform for businesses, um, starting off with shoplifting, but moving to the nighttime economy and a range of other businesses to be able to report and upload reports to the police of incidents that have been happening, also the CCTV at the same time. So that then means that that information is going to be assessed by a third party and passed on as intelligence to the police, even if it couldn't be uploaded for all the other shops to see. Um, there's a massive piece of work going on, and this is a priority for us with the, in the next three months from April to actually get the scheme up and running. Um, we're setting up a system that's worked working well in other parts of Sussex, and there's a big lead from Sussex Police uh, for this to be a priority. And in addition to that, the work that the PCC's office is doing with the larger businesses. So, for example, places like Carp and Tesco had a no challenge policy and didn't report half as many shoplifting offences previously. Uh, their staff were told to just let people walk out the door. Um, now, there's a national scheme that the PCC is involved in, which is about those larger businesses actually paying into a scheme to support the development for their staff and the systems they operate. And for us, as um, Councillor Bellis has mentioned, we've got a large number of independent stores. So the DIS system will allow those independent stores and independent businesses, whether it's restaurants or, you know, bars or whatever it is going forward, to be able to use this electronic system and it will be supported by the work of um, the neighbourhood policing team, as well as drug and alcohol services and other support agencies. Because we're looking at not just enforcement, we're looking at behaviour change in the medium term. Uh, we also have an issue at the moment with um, people being released from prison early. They're on short sentences for shoplifting and then they're released early. I have to say that in the last four or five months, Police and other agencies, including the council, have been made aware of that release early and work has been put in to change that behaviour and that shoplifting behaviour as quickly as possible, which is partly why the Chief Inspector Mendes is able to, sh to show the results he has, because they've been very proactive um, in making sure that a lot of attention and a lot of agency input is being put into that. So it is. Um, and it's on the top of our priority list as a JAG, and it is a priority, it is our top priority. Thank you, Carol. Does that satisfy you somewhat, Councillor Bayliss? I thought yeah. the answer was pretty good. Yes, I think, um, I, as I say, I was trying to make a, 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 a statement of support for our local businesses. I, I know that um, Carol and uh, Jay and, and his team are, are doing the best that they can. But this DISC system is, will be, the, it will be a, a, a real boost uh, in the fight against shoplifting. And the sooner we can get it in place, the better. Excellent. Right. So I think that was positive. <laughs> um, anyone else? No, nope, all happy. Um, so all we've got to do here is resolve that uh, this committee make any recommendations arising from the report to the chair of the Safer Role Partnership for consideration and secondly, the council's work in relation to antisocial behaviour, crime reduction and community safety be noted. Um, what are we 
What are we telling the chair of the Robber Safety Partnership to consider? Getting Councillor Bayes's anti shoplifting thing up and running, basically. Yeah, basically. So, good. Um, someone happy to move? Councillor John Barnes, seconded by Councillor Clark. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Um, thank you very much, Chief Inspector. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, good work. See you again next year. <laughs> or in the Chair, yep. I need to uh, leave the meeting. Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, go and go and do policey stuff or whatever. All <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. Thanks very much for your attendance, and thank you again, Carol. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. See you. Um, right. Moving on. Uh, item seven. Um, what have we got here? Report be noted. Um, note the estimated financial outturn for 23-24 based on expenditure and income for the quarter 3, 31st of December 23. Duncan, over to you. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, I just thought, Chair, I'll take you through the, the high-level highlights of the report, if that's OK, and then I'll uh, take any questions after that. Um, just in terms of the revenue position, uh, we've got the general fund summary within Appendix A to the report, and generally the, the variances are covered uh, up to paragraph 13. So the forecast outturn for the end of the year is estimated at about £2.7 million now. So that is slightly better than we anticipated at the last budget monitoring. It's improved by about £200,000. But it is higher than we originally budgeted for. So we budgeted to take 2.2 million from reserves. We're now looking at 2.7, so that's a half million pound additional cost. Um, as we've talked about in several of the other meetings, one of the main reasons for that is the ongoing pressure in terms of temporary accommodation um, and the way we're having to try and manage that. So it is uh, it is worse than budgeted, um, but improved from the last report, which is good. Just in terms of the capital position, again, there's an appendix within uh, Appendix B that covers the capital, and that's detailed within paragraphs 14 to 17 of the report. We're looking at projected capital spend at around £20 million by the end of the year. Um, the most recent forecast was for about £28 million. But again, as you'll all be aware, we're taking a fundamental review of the capital scheme. So that will mean more slippage in the scheme because we're taking that step back to review and make sure the outcomes are as anticipated. Um, and that does have a positive impact on our Treasury management position, both in terms of savings. So we're not borrowing as much as we forecast, so we're not paying those interest costs. But equally, we've got more cash in the bank, which supports our investment levels. So we're focusing more on Treasury management activities. And obviously, there is a benefit to the higher base rate in terms of our income coming in from that side of things. So we're looking to generate uh, additional savings and income from borrowing of around £1.1 million this year through our Treasury activities. So that's really, really positive. Um, and paragraphs 15 and 16 cover the capital movement since the last report. Um, there was some uh, information within the performance indicators on council tax and business rates. Uh, council tax is very, very similar to previous years. Um, business rates is very slightly down, just over 1%. Um, but actually, things are holding up fairly well, given the cost of living crisis that we're experiencing at the moment. So, again, that's that's positive. But we'll continue to monitor that, particularly in relation to the, the business rates situation. Um, so just in conclusion, Chair, we're looking at a forecast deficit of around 2.7 million. That's about half a million pounds more than we'd originally budgeted for. Um, we continue to face some of those challenges in terms of the demand leg pressures, particularly around temporary accommodation. Uh, the ongoing capital review does have a benefit in terms of the Treasury management position. So I just thought that was worth noting as well. But I'm happy to take any questions, Chair, if there's anything more specific. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, I just remind members this report has been to Cabinet, went to Cabinet on the 5th of February and has been referred to this committee for information. Um, and that report has been reproduced as it was given to Cabinet. Um, any questions or points? John? Yes, again, starting with the most positive element, 
I, I really do uh, want to congratulate our Treasury Management Team and Duncan on uh, the amount of income they're actually generating at the moment, uh, which is a very helpful uh, contribution to budget stability and is actually, I think, compensating for our failure uh, to actually deliver on the devolved savings, which were uh, quite an important part of the budget strategy and one which has largely not been fulfilled. I don't think we can take much comfort from the year-end position. Um, it's better than it might have been, but it's still substantially worse uh, than we budgeted for at the start of the year. Um, and we really do have to get that under control this year. Uh, but that's a message which I think has been totally taken on board. Uh, there are a couple of things really that I think we need to highlight again at overview and scrutiny. Um, the, the really bad one, and I, I still don't know what went wrong, is uh, on page 41, uh, which is the infrastructure cost of Blackfriars now at 21 million. And what is even worse is uh, we're years behind. Um, we should be building houses and we're not going to start building until next year at the earliest. So that's a pretty fair disaster and I really would still think that somebody has got to find out exactly what went wrong and learn the lessons from it. And we have got some work already being done at audit and best value, but, but I think we do need to bottom that one out and find out. The other side is a success story, but I think we need to push. Um, there's a very interesting figure earlier in our performance uh, review, uh, which uh, says that effectively, where we provide homeless accommodation, that saves about £7,000. Um, so it's a bit disappointing to see, and I, I understand the reasons, but when we look at temporary accommodation, we haven't actually uh, got the complete spend that we anticipated at the start of the year. We're not lagging badly, and we're getting on, but I do think we need to drive ahead with that, because, as I understand it, and Duncan will confirm, homelessness is probably about 12% now of our budget, and if we can get that figure down, um, we shall go a long way to actually helping ourselves out of the financial plight in which we find ourselves. So I do think that one needs another powerful push from this scrutiny committee. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I would tend to agree, but I, would, I could also sort of counter-argue that 12% of our spend on homelessness is, is, is pretty good compared to, to other neighbouring authorities. And when you watch the news sometimes and you hear the, the, the amount of budget spent on some of the, some of the councils up in the north of the country, you just, well, you, you know why they're, they're going bust. Yeah, I didn't um, want to sound critical because I think actually uh, we've gone in the right direction. It's just I think uh, we need to keep the foot on the accelerator um, because we ain't out of the wood yet. But yeah, compared with Hastings and Eastbourne, which are disaster areas in homelessness, uh, we are much better off. And we're much better off than most district councils. But all the more reason to reinforce success and push on exactly as the military would. When you're a, actually pushing through your offensive successfully, you reinforce it with more punch. Ben. Yeah, I thought it was, oh, thank you. sorry, thank you, Chairman. I think it's just sort of worth putting that number into context a little bit. It seems like an awful lot of money when you say, oh, we're half a million pounds behind. That's two, two houses. So... Given, given the scale of the programme that we've undertaken over the last few years and we're anticipating being over 50 homes owned 
by the end of the financial year, I'm confident that you know that that extra half a million will be picked up in pace because it really does only represent a couple of units, um, you know, three if you're talking about some some flats. So I think we uh, um, we will be looking to come back to ask for some for some more money to accelerate that program. I would also say that the success of the program has attracted continually attracted additional grant funding in from government to support various aspects of that program in terms of um, Afghan reset, resettlement and, and other aspects. So. Good. Um, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, regarding that temporary accommodation, um, it's so important that we made that decision four or five years ago that we go out and purchase. And that did come out of the Housing Needs Committee that Councillor Barnes chaired originally. Where we, the vision was that we would buy accommodation and sell our housing company. It's difficult to do the figures, but if we had not made that move, you know, we'd have been a lot more poor state. And the other thing is, sometimes you, you almost get to a completion when you're trying to buy a property and then people change their mind. So there, there is a drag sometimes on purchasing, you know, and, uh, and also the full figure. If you buy 12 properties, that's about 3 million quid. You only get about four, four properties for about a million if you're lucky. So... Um, you've got, like you said, like John said, you've got to keep driving and pushing and pushing because uh, if we end up with 50 or 60 properties in the long term, because it is all about the needs in the future, that will make us substantial savings. It's, if we hadn't made that decision years ago, we'd have been, I mean, the Haitians, I think they've got 500 families in temporary accommodation. It, it's absolutely killing them, you know, because they had no vision and did nothing. Um, anyone else? Any questions? No. Nope. Anything else you want to say, Duncan? No, thank you, no, Chair. No, nope, that's good. Um, well, resolved with report being noted. Move. Uh, um, push. Uh, I know. Do you need to push? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 think, I think they've got the message. <laughs> <laughs> I think they've got their message. Um, so moved by Councillor Cook, I'll assume sec seconded by Councillor John Barnes. Um, all those in favour? Report be noted. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Duncan. Oh, yeah. Made that mistake the other day. Ah, right. Uh, eight, to receive a presentation on the people's strategy and a workforce plan. Tim, over you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Um, I have prepared a presentation which I will share. Hopefully that is on screen in a moment. Excellent. Um, and I'm here this evening to talk to you about the uh, people programme of work for the District Council, which is something that I've been working with the senior leadership team and particularly with Ben as the uh, senior officer to develop our approach to a people strategy for RDC and in particular to look at a workforce plan which is one of the aspects that had previously been identified by auditors as a gap for the authority. So in terms of the presentation this evening I will talk you through the programme of work and opportunity for any questions or comments. So if the technology works, what I've prepared for you this evening is um, the context of the programme, which is one of the work streams within Fit for the Future, the work that we are doing on the people strategy, which is a precursor to the workforce plan that we mentioned a moment ago. I want to update committee on the development of values for the council and uh, set out the programme of work that we'll be undertaking through the spring and summer this year. So um, councillors will be familiar with the Fit for the Future programme. The people strategy is the top left-hand corner of the programme of work. I've also highlighted the fact that there are people implications of all of the other elements of the Fit for the Future programme. The financial resilience, will have implications in terms of staffing around new service models and shared services. Making the most of our assets will link in with our work in terms of agility 
and where the workforce operates from, how it operates, the technology that we need, and the digital program will be uh, crucial in terms of the way that we operate, the values and behaviours of the organisation moving forwards. So then the actual people strategy program itself starts with that people strategy. That will inform the organisational approach to organisational development, how we shape the organisation moving forwards. And one of the key elements of that that we've already made good progress on is values and behaviours, the expectations of the workforce and also our partners that we're working with. That will flow into the workforce plan and the workforce plan will inform a development programme of training. All of this will be underpinned by workforce data. So we've identified a gap in terms of we don't have a very good insight into our existing workforce. We will fill that gap, understand the workforce we have now and be able to measure progress of a people strategy and a workforce plan having established that baseline. We'll be working on an operating model. Again, this will flow from the people strategy, which is about how we deliver the council plan with our workforce. And that operating model will then shape organisational design. What does the future rather council look like? What do we need in terms of the leadership and management structure for the organisation? Where do we need capacity, capability to deliver our aspirations for the district? And that will include looking at those opportunities for shared services and partnership working. Where are there other organisations we can work with to deliver better outcomes for citizens? And finally, all of that work will then inform a refresh of HR policy. Once we've decided what the priorities are, what our workforce plan is, the shape of the organisation, we can then understand which policies do we need to update, what are the priorities here for us to make sure that we make progress on this agenda. So all of this then flows from that corporate plan, which will inform a target operating model, and this is about the purpose of the organisation, why we do what we do. That then sets out our aspiration for the workforce. What are the outcomes for colleagues at Rother? What do we want to achieve? And the measures associated with that. How are we going to know we've achieved our aspirations? That organisational development then is about shaping the organisation and how we deliver services to residents. In a moment, we'll have a look at the work that we've been progressing on values and the associated behaviours. We will then use that to inform our approach to leadership and management development, which is a really important part of the experience of the workforce. Good leadership and management means the workforce have a good experience. That then helps us to inform our approach to recognition, to reward and to benefits. How do we make sure we've got an offer which is attractive to the labour market, which retains, recognises and rewards our existing colleagues and brings in where we need to new people to support us to deliver the agenda? And that point around talent management. How do we identify the future leaders and managers in the organisation, the people with potential? How do we nurture them? How do we make RDC an attractive employer that brings people in and they can see a career pathway through to stay with us, to grow and to contribute? And all of that is the ingredients for a workforce plan. Understanding who we need, where we need them and when we need them so that we're able to say with confidence we have capacity and capability that we require to deliver this agenda for the district. Early work looking at the outcomes we want to achieve from a people strategy. 
And what we are setting out is those aspirations for the workforce. So along the left-hand side, what we want here is a workforce that is high-performing, diverse and inclusive, innovative and skilled, engaged and supported, working in partnership, and making a wider contribution. We then set out the commitments from the organisation. What is the council going to offer in order to achieve those outcomes on the left, and on the right, the metrics that we'll be using to determine progress against those objectives. We understand where we are, where we want to be, we want to see the impact of these interventions. So to deliver that, we've developed some pillars of a workforce strategy, and this is where I will hand over to Ben, who's been doing some work on this. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, I, I mean, in terms of in terms of how this came to, it's, I think it's really important to note that you know we've we've done quite a lot of engagement with staff. We did a, a, a as part of the um, the all staff event back in November. We we did some work around the values, which Tim's going to come on to uh, in a minute. But also, we did some uh, some work around the, some of the the areas that that staff really. Uh, worry about and I think what's what's probably key to say is that each of these areas that we've identified here are in need of improvement and the first of that is how we recruit people so it's it's very much going to start that, that workforce plan we'll look at the types of um, uh, candidates that we're going to be looking for the types of um, qualities and skills that we're going to need for a future workforce and then reviewing the, 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 the that process and the, the experience that somebody has coming into this organization you know, how coordinated is it? How do we sell ourselves as an organisation to attract better candidates? Uh, and, and that whole process. So the workforce plan will really flesh out that whole recruitment process. Once you're in the door, and for those staff who are already here, it's how do we invest in, in people? And where are we targeting that investment? I think it's, it's fair to say we've always been a very um, investment-focused organisation, but it's not always been particularly targeted in the right areas. We're very good at growing our own in terms of those technical skills, planners, environmental health officers. But as Tim mentioned, you know, we've not always been, we've not always had that good, fo that good focus on future leadership, future management, and, and, and sort of helping, helping uh, sort of junior staff grow into those more senior positions as they work through their career. So that's going to be a really key pillar in terms of that. Support is, is, is about what a, a, a modern employee expects out of their workplace it's not enough to just come here and I do my work you pay me money I go home anymore there's it, there's a lot more expectation out of employees in terms of wraparound support you know um, flexible working benefits but also um, you know how, how are we focusing on uh, on ensuring our, our employees uh, and, and colleagues uh, well-being overall and so that whole support theme will focus in and around that making this a great place to, 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 to work the Excel part is this, this the other side of the contract. That's, you know, if, if we're going to recruit right, we're going to invest well, and we're going to support our colleagues and our teams, then what is it that the organisation be, should be expecting in return? And that's, 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 that all comes down to good performance management. Now, that's, a, that's, that's beneficial to both the organisation and, to, and to, to colleagues because, you know, how do you know... How do you know what to improve if you don't know what you're not doing right in the first place? So it's about that positive um, feedback loop and making sure that, that, that we provide that support through proper and, and, and robust performance management, providing clarity on roles um, and, and things like that. And then having that, setting that expectation. We, you know, we as an organisation provide this. We as staff and colleagues are expected to deliver that. And it's about sort of that second side of the contract. So it's that mutual part really. Um, just really clarifying all those expectations across the board. I'm going to pass back over to Tim, who's going to sort of go into the next steps for us. Yeah. So the next steps then, oh, too far. The next steps are that review of the workforce data. And this is about understanding, in terms of recruitment, who's applying for our jobs, who's getting shortlisted, who's getting interviewed, how often are we failing to hire What's the experience like for candidates? What's the feedback from them in terms of going through that process? Understanding where our vacancies are, what our turnover rate is, understanding what people say when they leave us. 
what is it that's drawing them elsewhere. We want to understand better those absence rates, that link to the well-being and support. So are there patterns we need to be aware of? Is there support we're not providing? Do we need to enhance that? We want to make sure we're making the most of our apprenticeship levy and our training budgets, clear in terms of where we're spending money on development and the return on investment we're getting from that. Understanding the contingent workforce, where are we using agency staff, interim staff, consultancy staff, where's the business case for that, and crucially, where's the knowledge transfer? So if we're bringing in expertise and skills, how are we ensuring that some of that's retained in the organisation? And then the service plan review is going to support the work of the workforce plan, and this is about those pillars that Ben described. When we look at the service plans, what are the recruitment challenges? What are the challenges where we need to invest in the workforce? What are the challenges where we need to support? And where do we need to excel around performance management? So we're bringing together a working group with a cross-section of staff across the organisation who will look at all of this data, look at this information, and shape the people strategy, finalise the values, finalise the work on a workforce plan so that we have got that buy-in from people to the approach that we're taking here and confident it is addressing the issues that you've identified. That workforce plan will then think about how do we get the right workforce? So do we need to build our own? Do we need to buy in short-term capability? Do we need to borrow working with partners and seconding? Do we need to bind and find ways to retain people with market supplement payments or the like? Are there areas where we need to understand people are not performing and look to bounce out of the organisation? Are there digital solutions where we can boost capacity and capability, use a bot to do something differently? And all of those different dimensions then inform how do we address the challenges we've identified? That data, those service plan insights, all of that comes together to inform the workforce plan and the learning and development plan so that we've covered those bases in terms of where are we are getting people from, how are we upskilling them, how are we going to make sure we've got the colleagues we need, right place, right time. And then finally, to share the latest version of the draft values for the organisation. And this comes out of the work that Ben referenced earlier with colleagues in November last year, looking at what staff felt the values of the organisation were. Reviewing all of the words that they used and bringing those together to come down to this mnemonic of ROOT. So those values being respect, openness, outcomes and together. This was what the voice of the staff told us. And actually, I think it's a useful um, illustration of values as a root of the organisation underpinning everything that we do. So there's further detail. I'm not going to read through it all. But you can see highlighting the behaviours which have been identified underneath those values headings. And one of the first tasks for the People Strategy Working Group will be to review those and think about how those are incorporated into performance management, into learning and development, into management standards. And then finally, the next steps for the programme. So during the spring, that People Strategy Working Group will be finalising the People Strategy and the Organisational Development Plan informed by the workforce insights that we've got and those that we're developing, those will then determine the workforce plan and the people policy priorities out of that. <coughs> I mentioned the working group a moment ago. They will be starting work on this week after next. And we will be working on those metrics around performance, productivity, retention, turnover, with the intention that we'll be able to start reporting these on a quarterly basis in the new financial year. And then finally, that work on operating model, the future shape of the organisation, 
and the development plan will start to come together in the summertime. So that is a whistle stop of the people programme, the work streams and the presentation will be shared with committee. Um, I won't ask you to squint at all of the milestones in there, but rest assured that there is a plan to deliver all of this. That completes the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Right. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, we don't necessarily have anything to recommend or do as such. We've just literally received a presentation. On my briefing, I've got here, what have I got? Uh, lots of work already undertaken, as we can see. Officer working group to include union to be established to assist with developing the documents. This will happen over the next few weeks, as Tim said. Um, member briefings will be held later in the year to advise on progress, so that keeps us up to speed. The HR committee will review and approve any final documents. Um, so that's sort of pretty much that. And I'll be sort of honest, being a self-employed carpenter for the last 40 years, a lot of that went over the top of my head. But then, given the state of my hair, quite a thing, few things have gone over the top of my head. So, um, <laughs> someone who knows more about it than me can, can comment. Um, Councillor Clark. Yes, Chairman, uh, there's nothing you can really disagree with in the aims and objectives, but... Um, some of us have been around this table a long time. We were operating with about 20% less staff than we were some years ago. And um, I would be very worried if a lot of this work wasn't going on, has not been going on already. I mean, when you talk about, uh, I don't know, quite a number, I talk to the staff, they get regular supervisions because they can raise their concerns um, with management. Um, they're very flexible, our staff. Very often they move around the building, building for somebody. So um, I think we've got a highly motivated staff, and a lot of the things that are on that, I'm sure we were, we were doing or are doing. Maybe we're going to refine it, but I'm sure a lot of that was going on anyway. And uh, when you talk about, is we we'll say a rep um, recruit the best possible person for the post? Well, we surely do that anyway. I and mean, we have a competitive process, you have candidates for a post and the one is most qualified and articulate and has all the skills required will get that post. You know, I mean, so I don't quite see the allergy, an analogy there. And, um, and also, we know in the past some of our officers have been cherry-picked and gone elsewhere and that's about money. Simple as that. And some staff will go to other authorities where they think they've got a better package. So, it ain't all about, it can be about money. Or it may be a family issue, they've got family uh, who live in this area that suits them to come here. So there are other all sorts of issues around why people might want to be recruited to rob them. But money is, is an issue. But years I've been on this council, I know the staff have been very well supported. And we do get good input from them about the, their issues. So you may refine that, but I'm, I'm sure we were doing a lot of that anyway, and I've been doing that. Sorry. Ben, you want to come in? Or Tim? Thank you, yes. And absolutely, a lot of that good work is happening across the organisation. It's about assurance that it's happening across the entirety of the organisation. And also, where there are teams that are doing a particularly good job, how do we share their approach? So a lot of this is about unearthing the good things that are happening and making them visible and sharing them. On the point of recruitment, absolutely always looking to appoint the best and recruit on merit. We have seen, particularly in recent times, and it is a national challenge, more and more roles that are hard to recruit. So then how do we make rather a particularly attractive prospect? And it links with the point around recognition and reward. What is it we're competing against? What do we need to do differently? How do we promote what we already do more effectively? Thank you. Uh, Tim actually said most of what I wanted to say, but I think, you know, things have grown organically. 
you know, and we are going to be, when we look forward and we think about, you know, the kind of council we need to be in, in the future, isn't it better that we design that and we work together to understand what the needs are going to be in the future? So, you know, teams might look quite different. I'm sure our teams now look quite different to how they looked 10 years ago. And we, we need to project forward and think about what we need in the future. And this is something that has been picked up, I think, by Grant Thornton. It's at least two years that we need a workforce plan. Our data isn't good. That's something that we do need to work on. It's something we need to improve. Um, and just having things more for, formal, it's, it's, it's all quite informal. The, the way that different teams approach training and development, not all that consistent across the board. So it gives us an opportunity to look at all of that. But I reiterate what Tim said, there's some great practice. Um, we're not saying that everything needs throwing up in the air and it's all wrong. Absolutely not. This is about having a more structured approach and actually designing the, our, our workforce to what we need to the future. Um, and that's about putting the right training in place if roles perhaps do need to change and perhaps they won't exist in the future. It's, it's about knowing that so we can prepare for that and redeploy. Um, so, you know, this, this is very much about supporting our, our staff. And you're right, it, money is important. We've seen that quite recently. Um, but the benefits, training, the kind of place that Rother is and the kind of culture that we want here is really important too. So hence why we're doing this, this piece of work. Um, I'm really excited about it. I think it's great. Um, we're really engaging with staff to um, make sure that they're involved in shaping this and that's vital. And, you know, when we come out the other side, I think Tim's here for about another five months doing this, this, this work. We'll, we'll have a plan that we can execute and demonstrate that we are planning for the future. And that's something at the moment, if you ask me where all this is going and what our workforce will look like in 18 months, two years, you know, it'll be quite hard to say. So it's, it's about absolutely understanding. And it is linked to financial resilience and some of the you know we do need to look at sharing our services what does that mean for the kind of council that we need to be in the future um so you know that fit for the future it's actually all linked but if we don't get this people bit right nothing else happens so that's really really important but thank you chair okay, okay. um councillor creaser um that was extremely intense um, and full of information is it possible, I realise it's a draft, but is it possible for us to have um, a copy of that? Because I'd like to really look through it again, because there's such a lot in there. Um, and excellent work, thank you. And we'll make it easier for me to understand too. Councillor Barnes, John? Yes, I, I was grateful there's a timeline on this. And uh, I think uh, we're making good pace in the right direction. Um, two or three things which I think I'd like to see a little bit more on. The, the way we're foreseeing technology and the way we actually partner man par, well, person par, I'd better say. Um, I'm an old-fashioned guy. Um, with the new technology and new ways of working because um, there is much more home working. There's a downside to that because when you're building teams and you strike ideas off one another much easier in contact than you ever do on screen. Um, and I think uh, we've got to keep a balance there. Um, I'm not against putting quite a lot of emphasis on diversity and inclusion, but they are a means. Uh, they're not an end in themselves. Um, and I've, I always find it slightly uneasy when they drift up to the top of the list. Um, they're very important, but they're not, to my mind, as important as some of the other categories about developing people uh, and about innovation and how you get people to think innovatively. And then there's a, an interesting thing about the complexity of local government. 
I seem to remember years ago, um, a chap called Renzus Weikert wrote about overlapping work groups and the need of a variegated pattern. I'd like to know a bit more about are we going for a flat management structure, how far we're going to push budgets down. Um, there, are, there are kinds of detail that go beyond that sort of workforce plan which tell me what sort of organisation we're going to be. And um, hopefully by the summer we'll have fleshed some of that out. The big area and the big challenge is partnership working uh, because that creates its own tensions um, and it clearly is the future for small district councils uh, but we really do need to map that very carefully and get our working agreements very crystal clear uh, because otherwise you can find yourself landed in problems which you haven't anticipated. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think the name you mentioned sounded like a striker for Real Madrid or someone, or oh, Munich or something, but so that's as much as I know about it, I'm afraid. Um, Simon, you're online. Um, hands up. Over to you. Thanks, uh, Chair. Yeah, I just, I, I, it, this sounds really positive and, you know, it, it'll be um, sort of a familiar process for many people who have been through this you know, we've been we've been trying to make the uh, our public sector even leaner and more productive than it already is. It sounds impossible, I know, but uh, you know, we we uh, I, I think you know we, we're we're good at this in the public sector, and um, and it's positive to see the direction that rather we're going in. Um, just I just and I you know tell me if I'm sort of straying into uh, operational stuff here, but uh, and I'm sure. Lorna um, and your colleagues, Lorna, will, you know, you'll be all over this. But, um, you know, for me, the importance about this kind of process is where, well, um, is where culture and systems lead this kind of um, development rather than being process led. Um, so it's, it's, it's about, you know, not losing the importance of the outcome for the person. Um, and everyone being part of that, you mentioned, um, you know, the, 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 the strong culture and the positive culture and rather. And that's just so important to cherish and to nurture and, and to help to to lead this kind of process, because that's that's, uh, you know, you, you I know you'll agree that's where it really comes from and that's where you get results from. And um and you know, I think where where we can engage systems thinking to, you know, to really work our way through what it is we're doing and what the outcome for the what goes in at the beginning, what comes out at the end, and how it gets there, and what's the best way of doing that, and who, who's best to contribute to that. It's such an, a fascinating journey, and uh, you know, just sort of you know, pro, process of discovery. And my plea is just to, as you've already said, is just to include every level of staff in that um, and you know people take their hats people people can take their hats off whatever stage they whatever um, you know wherever they are in the organization just to and allow to contribute and to that process and it can be very productive and, and fruitful uh, but yeah it'd just be really interesting to see how this progresses thank you thank you um, do you want to come back on that Tim Thank you, Chair. Yes, and I think um, to pick up absolutely led by um, culture and system before process and that system point, particularly picking up the earlier point about working across the wider system and partnership and recognising who is best placed to deliver services and how do those workforces work across boundaries to secure the best outcomes for citizens. And it is very much something that we intend as a senior leadership team will be collaborative with the workforce and with our partners, led by the corporate plan, which will inform our operating model, which will then shape the organisation. And to the other point, our understanding in terms of how many people we need doing what, their responsibilities, where they're working across organisations, what that looks like. So that detail will start to emerge in the summer.
Thank you. Uh, Lorna, do you want to come in? Yes, I, I just wanted to pick up on, it was in Tim's um, slides, but what, one thing that we do need to do is that service challenge. And are staff a best place to tell us how can we do things differently? Are there, are, are there ways of saving money? Actually, can we stop things? They're not actually needed. Any, you know, it, was, it was designed years ago. We, we still do this. We don't need to. And when it comes to that question, are, are we best placed to do this? That's when we have to raise our heads up and look at other shared services, community and voluntary sector, um, and we need to work with others. So partnership is absolutely key to this. Um, and it's really, really important that we don't do that to our colleagues. We, they are actually driving that forward. So we're putting support in place through Anna's team to be able to facilitate those discussions. But it's very much the plan that this is teams coming up and taking a step back, looking at what they do, thinking about what they're not doing now that we need to be doing in the future as well. Um, so it's, it feels like there's a lot going on. And to be honest, there absolutely is. But we have a plan. And we're working through that plan. Those four work streams in Fit for the Future are un underpinning everything we are doing. Um, so it's, it's quite intense, but we need to get through this and we need to move at pace because we can't have one of those work streams fall falling behind. They kind of all need to work together. So um, hopefully that's reassuring. And um, really, it's a good feedback, and it's great that that resonates with those that perhaps work in a corporate kind of business or, or another council or something like that, that you recognise that this is something that we need to be doing. So um, thanks very much for your comments. Um, Councillor Maynard, Carl. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see this piece of work come forward. And I think I just, I'm not going to repeat everything everybody else has said. It would be folly to do so. But just to say that you know, in the past, I've been critical of the fact that I think in, this, in the last staff restructure, we lost some of the resilience within the organisation because so many uh, we lost so many senior members of staff. And, and since then, it has to be said that the figures speak for themselves in terms of staff costs, perhaps because of agency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of obviously hiring agency staff, it's not something we did before to the level that we've been doing um, fairly recently. And I think that talking about partnership working that's clearly hugely important because where we can um, get expertise especially from other public sector where we can share resource it's an absolute no-brainer building up the resilience working with the, rest of the existing staff we have to do so is something that we should all be very keen on because quite clearly um, we want to value our staff but we also need to know where we have gaps and obviously it, it does, I'm afraid, come down to costs. We need to um, really drill down on, on, on those things that we do do as statutory services and indeed those that we do as non-statutory services. And as Lorna said, in terms of looking at the third sector, in terms of looking at innovative ways to do things. And I think I really welcome the approach of being truly inclusive with the staff we have at the moment in terms of a bottom-up approach as well as a top-down one so that the senior management team and all members of staff can feel that everybody's had their say and that we are moving forward. But I think the one thing I would add is that we have really grown our own staff uh, really well historically over the years. Some of you will remember a previous chief executive who started off at the bottom rung and ended up as chief executive. Um, but quite clearly, it's also really important if you want um, an authority to thrive and go forward into the future with innovative new ideas, you need to bring new people in, um, whether they be at the bottom end of the pay scale or at the very top. And I think that's something that what's in front of you tonight should hopefully achieve that. But for me, it's about obviously making sure that we can do the things we need to do um, at an affordable level, but it's also about bringing back that resilience that, frankly, we previously had within the organisation that I'd certainly like to see restored. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you for the piece of work, Tim, and thank you for the presentation. Really interesting. And as Councillor Creaser said, I think um, a, um, a very, very valid piece of work and something that uh, will take some time to digest all of it, I'm sure. But I'm really pleased to see that, that the staff will be fully involved. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I think it's probably worth mentioning, Tim's only been here about a month. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so he, he, as we say, he's, he's cracked on a bit. Um, 
Anybody else? No. Um, well, I, I, I don't think there's much else I want to say except say thank you, Tim. Thank you very and, much. Uh, thank we, you. we look forward to a member briefing to be held later in the year to advise on progress. Thanks. <laughs> thank thank you very much. Thank Thanks so much. Cheers. Um, right. Uh, item nine. Uh, what have we got here? Review a draft contract specification for new grounds maintenance contract. Uh, recommendation be resolved that this committee be requested to review the draft contract specification as per Appendix 2 and subject to no suggested amendments, officers be authorised to commence the tender progress without further recourse to Cabinet. Um, there is a bit of a timeline on this one, but a tight timeline. Um, so I'd better go over to Deborah, who sat there quite patiently for two hours waiting. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everybody. I hope I won't lose my voice delivering this, but uh, I'll try not to talk for too long. Um, the grounds and maintenance contract currently operated by ID Verdi is due to expire on the 30th of November this year. Um, it does not include the management of trees. That's a separate contract, and it is a, a currently a performance-based contract, and it's split into routine works and non-routine works. Um, the first few paragraphs of the, of the report explain what the difference is between the, the routine and the non-routine works, and then some of the um, cost savings that we've already made on the contract. Now, the maintenance of the public grounds, um, including parks, open spaces, and sports pitches, is not a statutory duty, and so qualifies as a discretionary service that can be withdrawn or reduced if necessary. And as we're aware, the council has a budget deficit of some 3.8 million at the moment and is seeking to make savings where possible. And we're looking at the grounds maintenance contract to see what we can do there. So the maintenance and operation of the two cemeteries, Bexton and Rye, is largely self-funding, uh, revenue being generated through fees and charges. Um, for items such as burials, interments, and memorials. And so um, the specification for the cemeteries will remain more or less as it is now. Um, so no changes there. The maintenance of the sports grounds and pitches, including bowling greens, is one of the most expensive aspects of the current um, contract and is no longer affordable. The officers are working with the clubs to hand over the grounds for the clubs to maintain from the six or from November onwards this year. So the sports um, grounds are not included in the specification. So it's proposed that a new contract for the routine works be sought based on a frequency of service delivery as opposed to performance delivery at a budget of approximately £250,000 per annum, which is quite a significant reduction on the current contract costs. And then we would be budgeting for approximately 122,000 for non-routine works, um, as set out in paragraph 17 of the report, and cemeteries, as I say, to continue to be maintained as they are at a cost of about £120,000 per annum. And all those would obviously be allowing for inflation year on year. Um, it should be noted that this is um, direct contract costs and does not include further costs such as officer time and back office support. So the reduced budget, thus the reduced specification of routine works will inevitably impact the level of service that can be provided um, and there are plans to communicate these changes to residents in, in a positive and as clear way as possible and in a timely fashion. We have done some soft market, market testing um, on, on what contractors out there um, would be interested in such a contract. And we did get a, a number of responses that indicated that we would be looking for at least an initial period of five years. Often these contracts would look for 10 years um, to make um, investment into equipment and things like that. But we want to leave it flexible, leave our options open going forwards. So we're, we're seeking a contract for five years with the, the potential to extend for another five years if we want to. Um, 
So officers will seek a contract based on delivering critical services according to the specifications set out in the appendixes um, attached uh, and importantly to allow for as much flexibility as possible within procurement regulations to allow for future devolvement and changes to the annual budget. Thank you, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Mm. Well, going to be some changes, obviously, if we're going to have half the money being spent. Um, I know Councillor Burton's going to have a couple of questions. One of them is going to involve glyphosate, I should think. Um, I would say one thing I've got to... I'm always... I know that you, you said they're sort of non-statutory. Um, you know, some of the sort of maintenance things are non-statutory. My sort of argument back would say, well, if we don't do it, who else does? You know, and that's, that's almost sort of seems to me like, you know, it's part of, of the being, isn't it? You know, who, who provides swimming pools, who provides sports pitches, who provides is what we do. You know, I know sort of for a fact almost that, you know, the bowls club in Rye will, will fall at the end of this year. That's what I've been told. I was told that over the weekend, which is a shame. They've been running for 40 odd years. Um, you know, and you sort of think, well, you know, I know there in Rye there was sort of moaning about uh, one of the sorts areas that was sort of left to grow long. Um, you know, is it a wildflower meadow or is it not? It's not really. It's long grass. The wildflower meadow takes years to establish. Um, you know, and you can go back over the years, that used to be the carnival site and there was music festivals on there and everything else. And I understand that someone's been looking at sort of doing festivals on there or not, but you couldn't do it if the grass is too foot high. So it's a difficult one. Um, yeah, I, yeah, it is a difficult one. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Burt because you sent me an email. <laughs> I come first because I sent an email. Well, I had some very helpful. I said sent an email, thank you, Chair, to oh, I need to re declare my interest as a Battle Town Councillor. Um, I had some communications with Deborah to answer some of my questions, which was very helpful. However, I want to um, really bring to everybody's attention that this is a really crucial moment in our quest to be green to the core not business as usual and we need to i think step back and think what exactly can we do how can we make the best opportunity of this contract to take forward our our uh, goals um, and i know deborah is with me on that so i have so of course i'm going to mention pesticides and herbicides and i would say that we perhaps need to be bolder in saying that we should have a zero tolerance to pesticides and herbicides in your green spaces and your beds. We as an authority need to be set an example uh, to our residents of how to do it, the future and communication of course is very important but this is a moment where we could be bold and we don't want to find ourselves in the situation that we're tied up, that we can't move forward with this agenda. How, how can we do that? Because we're concerned about cost. So there is a, um, uh, the Pesticide Action Network, which assists local authorities with their policies to make these changes. They know, just as we know, that we, they can't put extra monies in these things. And they propose a roughly a three-year program for an authority to become uh, uh, to be pesticide-free. So I would really try to exp we explore that to the full and don't tie ourselves to something that we will regret in the future. Um, I also was a little bit concerned, although you have mentioned about devolvement, um, the green spaces in the local parishes are not mentioned, like we have Kingsmead in battle, and the play area is very much uh, 
a green space uh, and a play area. So um, I obviously I'm not a procurement expert, but how can how is that are we going to get the benefit? Because I would be hopeful in the next three to five years that some of these changes of development will happen and will that have be a benefit to this organization. Um, a few more things. Uh, uh, we I know a number of, of the parishes have followed No Mo May and they're now all talking about longer than May Mo May, but let's start with Mo, No Mo May. And I we have a found experience in, in battle that by introducing it year on year, it doesn't give a planning of the of the contractors to do the work before May, so they keep things smart. So although it can easily be introduced by officers, I would, from, from experience, found that it would be worth it. And all these changes will give our new contractor the, the message that we as an authority want to do all we can to move forward in relation to climate. A um, couple more things. Uh, composting, I would have expected, again, set an example, local composting in the areas as much as they can. I would like to see evidence of that. And my final point, there's an ex section about the staff qualifications uh, that we are expecting from the contractor. And I would think we would be very reasonable to expect them to have an environment and biodiversity in their makeup of their staff. We're not talking about maintenance, we're talking about doing a lot more. Thank you, Jane. Have we, I'm assuming that, that um, Lucy and Elise have, have looked through this, because I'm, I'm sort of saying, yeah, if you've got a new contract, and saying that we said at the Environment um, Committee is, you know, going forward, should we insist that our you know, the, the maintenance contractors have battery-powered chainsaws, battery-powered strimmers, and, you know, the, the equipment's getting better. I was talking to a gardener friend of mine today, and he's slowly changed. He's even got a lawnmower. He's got a fancy lawnmower now that the battery lasts for about an hour and takes 20 minutes to charge, which suits him fine. Work for an hour, cup of tea for 20 minutes, work for an hour. So, um, <laughs> we're not the best way if you've got a gang of blokes, but... Yeah, you know, is is that something else we're sort of talking to to potential bidders? The soft market test, when we did it, talked about everything because we are all on the same wavelength. We're all very keen um, to deliver a, 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 as much biodiversity and green, um, um, not issues, but, but but green elements as that we can. Um, but we've cut this contract from just under a million to half that. This will come in at about 492,000 with a lot of luck. It's going to be very tricky to actually, you know, get a good tender in on this contract. It is, it's quite a big change. So we're going to try and do the best we can with what we've got. So we're going to go out to tender with a priority of, number one priority is to empty the bins, and collect the litter, do the um, play area inspections, so the specification is an awful lot about the priority um, items that we want. We want to maintain Edgerton Park, its high visitor numbers, and the seafront, because they uh, attract our visitors and support that. So, you know, the, the, there's not a lot of give at the moment. However, the contract is written so that if happily in time to come, very quickly, we, we are able to, to, to get more funding we can then expand on what the basics that we've got um, and, and, and who knows if that will be forthcoming in, in the years coming up. With regards to the pesticides and herbicides, that's included in the specification, but it's something that we can choose, we can dictate. So if people are happy to have flower beds and rose beds that are weed, weedy um, and are happy to tolerate that without using pesticides and herbicides, then we can go down that route. But if people are asking for something different to that, then we have the specification covered in terms of qualifications and the experience the contractor would have to deal with that. So we're, we're trying to allow for flexibility, but also be able to choose the sort of service that we want to deliver 
bearing in mind those top priorities that must come first. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but uh, it's, it's not, an easy, not an easy one, I'm afraid. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I do hear everything you're saying. I think the point I was trying to make is about um, things that don't cost that we can, how we do something is important. If you cut a hedge down to a foot or so, you, instead of having it higher, if you have it higher, you have more berries. If you have it low, you've chopped the berries off. So it's about talking about trying to get the message through this contract is that trying to do things that don't have an exp expense, ex huge, in, in greater expense. And, and I think we will be able to do that in, with, with this contract. We will be able to direct that to a large extent. Councillor Barnes, John, did you indicate? Well, I, I hate what I'm about to say, but I think I've got to say it, um, because although I'm a low-tax Tory, um, we have in the past charged special expenses in Bexhill, Rye and Battle, and to a large extent, uh, that has funded the maintenance budget. Devolution clearly ought to be uh, part of the solution here and isn't. Um, and we're going to lock ourselves into a five-year contract renewable. Um, so I think somehow we've got to build a bit of flexibility in around that to allow town councils um, where they feel able to do so uh, to take on some share of the burden. But in the meantime, I see a case for keeping a modicum of special expenses going um, because it seems to me that it may be a non-statutory service, but one of our largest industries is in fact the tourist industry. And the appearance of Edgerton Park and the seafront and places like that, and I can think of areas in Rye that are of similar importance, they are key to actually making this an attractive place to come to. And if we can't actually afford it out of our revenue budget, but there is a tax source which would actually be prayed in aid, I think we should look at that. Uh, I'm not saying it's the total answer, and indeed I think we should take the opportunity at this moment of greening our contract as far as possible, uh, because that is usually going to be more cost effective. Um, by definition, as you move towards rewilding, uh, you tend on the whole to have lower costs. Um, the trouble is you've got to keep a balance between rewilding and attraction, and that, that's a difficult balance to strike. And that's for Deborah, I'm afraid, um, to try and hold that balance. I do want to emphasize my support for what Sue said about uh, getting rid of pesticides and herbicides as rapidly as possible. We have a substantial diminution in pollinators in this country, and we really do need to treat that as an emergency and do something about it. And, yeah, I think that's the one positive side about this, is we do have a chance to reset the contract in ways which allow us uh, to actually further biodiversity and try to bring pollinators back into the system to a far greater extent than they are at the moment. But um, I, I, to give up, I mean, equally on the sports grounds, I can see what you're doing. I think it's a, the right direction where, in fact, you don't kill off the sports clubs as a result. 
But again, remember, we have a public health agenda. We have a public health crisis where longevity has actually stalled and we're trying to keep people out of hospital and yet we are liable to find that we have some casualties in the sports clubs. I do expect the town council to step up to the plate and I think we should. But I think we need also uh, to bear in mind that special expenses have a long history and could be used, I think, to obviate uh, some of the damaging things that we might otherwise do. That said, I see you're keeping the non-routine budget safe, and that's good. Um, but 400,000 cut is a very substantial cut indeed. Um, it's effectively 75%, isn't it, of... Uh, if you're keeping your non-routine and your cemeteries outside, you're coming down from 900 to 250. I don't know. No, I, I'm, I'm exaggerating. It, it, it'll be a half rather than 75%. But it is a pretty savage cut. And one on which I take it we've consulted the public. Um... I take it the town councils have been told what the effect is likely to be. But um, perhaps we should provide a, a bit of a, a financial inducement by actually saying, look, if you don't do it, we shall have to charge some special expenses, even if it's a much smaller sum than we've charged the other two. Yeah, I... I... It's a difficult one. I was speaking to someone over the weekend, and you know, in, in my patch, you know, most of the you know, parishes look after their own. Yeah, uh, yeah that's the thing. And you know, I only know Rye, you know, to be honest, not so much about Bexhill. Um, you know, I'm sort of, I could say, I'm disappointed in the town council. But I then I know for the last 40 years the town council have wanted the source back. Um, you know, with a car park to pay for everything. Um, I'll add that. But, um, yeah, it, it's difficult that, you know, it, I'm assuming the cricket club are, are, are going to take over the cricket sorts in Rye. But equally, you know, the, the, bowl, the, the, the skate park belongs to the town council. Um, you know, you know, I, I don't envy you this job, to be honest. <laughs> Deborah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, it seems my lot at the moment, doesn't it, to be making cuts. But um, we're still working with the, the, the sports clubs to see how we can progress things. And we had a very positive start, and we're just following through with letters. We've had meetings with each of them individually. And, um, yes, we're hoping that we'll have some positive outcomes. Yeah, because I think my only sort of concern is that, that you know, this, this, this is our only chance, really, as councillors, to look at this. Then it, then it goes out, and, it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a quick one, to be honest, to get it in place. It's not going back to Cabinet, or, you know, it's there. And, what I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of concerned that, that we get a contract in place, and then, then a sports club come back and says, what happens then? You know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I suppose you've got to find the extra money or you charge them more to, to use it. But, yeah, go on. What, what happens then? Uh, the clubs have all been advised that if they can't take on the grounds, then it will be treated as normal recreation grounds and just maintained as a grass cut. Yeah, but then equally, as John said, and as I've sort of said before, that doesn't sort of tie up with our council agenda for keeping people active and fit and out and about and meeting people, does it? It's, it, it is a difficult one. Um, I've got a number of councillors. I've got Charlie Clark first, Charlie, and then I'll go Mary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I don't envy when you look at these, this subject because when you look at a, um, the issue of play parks, I think we've got about 28 in Robert. 
there's no room for manoeuvre because uh, on health and safety, it has to be properly maintained. Uh, we've got a lovely to toddler's park in my ward. Draft it cut regularly. A guy goes round and he sees none of the bolts coming loose on the equipment and, and uh, they litter pick it once a week. So you can't reduce any of that. If, if you reduce the number of maintenance checks and, and something happens and you had a claim again, so it would be damned expensive. You know, so there's not an area where you can really make savings on play parks because it has to be maintained a high standard on health and safety issues. Mary? Thank you. Um, there's much in this report about the maintenance of shrub beds and seasonal bedding and all that sort of thing. Um, there's absolutely nothing at all about the provision of those plants, of any seeds, of any plants, of any planting to be done. Um, and even if you're talking about rewilding, even the maintenance of a wild flower bed needs some sort of knowledgeable maintenance skill. Um, and I just wondered whether there's something here that I've missed, but you know, references made to rose beds, for example. Who is providing the, ro the roses? I mean, um, we haven't got anything in here that actually says, you know, we will have flower beds um, and they will be, you know, the plants will be put in those flower beds. 13.3, plants to be grown in plant pack 18, growing tray or similar in peat-free compost, contracted to provide evidence on request. Plants will be well established and pest and disease free. Then that is, that is um, to be desired. Sorry, that is to be desired, but it doesn't actually tell the contractor that he's supplying them. Deborah, you can yes, answer that one. That, I failed. That, <laughs> thank you. That is the desire, to be flexible. So if we want, we've got the money, we can go and purchase. I mean, obviously the rose, the rose beds, they're still there, the roses, the rose, the rose bushes, they're there, they are currently. We've um, done away with the, 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 the bedding plants along East Parade, that's now grassed. Um, so we're gradually re reducing the number of bedding plants that, that, we are, that we are planting and purchasing, because it is an expensive aspect of the contract. So... That's the sort of changes that will be made. Chairman, I think this is very sad. I mean, really sad, because I do take my husband's point about tourism um, and, and what, what people's expectation is to see a certain degree of flower beds kept fresh and alive. Um, and even, even, even rose plants die after a time. I would like to think that they would be replaced. And I take, take your point about the seed trays. Somebody's got to supply those. Uh, who wants Go on, bed camera. If I, just to come quickly back to that. Obviously, the, the £250,000 will be spent in order of priority, as the other councillor mentioned. So um, when we get down to um, what can be afforded in Edgerton on, on the seafront, um, the contract allows for that to be then purchased. So... Bedding in, in those priority places will be replaced as necessary and rose bushes and things like that. It could just be the, the lesser areas that might change. It, it doesn't actually say so in here. So I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit worried that it may not happen. You know, that they will say, well, there's nothing in my contract that says I've got to do this, so therefore I won't, because I'm, I'm on such a, sh a small budget. So, you know, I am anxious about it. Thank you, Councillor. Um, as the current contract allows, we, we, do, we work very closely with the contractor to, to provide that service. and We will wait to see what the tenders bring in in terms of what they can offer for that £250,000 on routine works. And then anything additional can come in under the non-routine works if it's, if it's viable and desirable. Councillor Creaser. Um, right, our council, um, we've been um, investigating and working with the local community in terms of the devolved services and, of course, the um, grounds maintenance is, it features large. Um, we have um, had for some years now a um, town steward service and they do our planting um, and where the county... Uh, 
had some um, mowing responsibilities in Rye. Um, the town, and they've just passed it over to the town steward for a fee. Um, so there is that. Obviously, we do need to clear this up. Um, I did, like yourself, I got um, approached at the weekend um, about the bowls club in particular. Now, I was one of the councillors. Who, oh, I should say I'm a writer councillor. I forgot that bit. Um, but one of the counts, one of the um, myself and another a, a group of other councillors had a meeting with each of the groups in the town to see what their thoughts were. The people that came from the bowls club, the membership of the bowls club is very, very small. And most of them don't live in Rye anyway. So that, that is a bit of an issue. Um, when this young man approached me on Saturday, uh, and he was saying about it, and I said, well, if you want to continue with the bowls club, then you've got to start thinking how you're going to make it happen. Because we can't expect everybody in the town to, play, to pay for something that only half a dozen people use. Um, and it is expensive because the, the special grass and all that malarkey. So um, I suggested to him, which is I had already suggested, or we had already suggested to the group of people that came in to write our council, um, that they consider buddying up with another group, i.e. Um, the, the cricket club. Because the cricket club have quite specific outcomes that they need for their grass. And, of course, that would gel very nicely with the bowls club. I have no idea whether they've gone to, to Martin Blinko or not, um, but he runs a really good club, and he's actually been quite innovative. He, he rents rooms out upstairs in the clubhouse to other groups and that to have a bit of revenue, and then that gives them the opportunity to be more self-sufficient. Um, and that, that's something that we've been doing with various people. I can absolutely understand the problems that we've got. I don't think they're for any other reason that life is moving on, and as you are clearly um, working on it, we need to move along with them. Um, it's not going to get any easier for any of us, whether we are members or officers. It is not going to get any easier. I mean, I've already had my ears chewed quite quite happily about the brown bins. I only had little ears to start with. <laughs> um, so I think the thing of it is, is people have got to be realistic. And I do say that to them. You know, then they're going on about, it's gone up from 55 to 80 odd, that kind of stuff. Sorry. Um, and so we've got all of that sort of thing going on. So I, I, I'm under the impression that the town councils, parish councils and ward members are getting together. Uh, and we've been invited to, to go along to that. I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> so, um, so we will go along to that, and we'll see what we can come up with. But we need to put our heads together. We're not on opposite sides. We are all together. And that's the message I've been giving into uh, the community in Rye. If we want to get a solution, if we want to keep these things, we've got to come up with solutions, not challenges. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Right, um, time's cracking on. Um, Councillor Maynard, Carl. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. You'll be pleased to hear that the internet glitches tonight has just seen a bright green Councillor Creaser sitting on the lap of Deborah Keneally through that entire speech. So, uh, strange internet glitches. I can certainly vouch for those. It reminded me of that show I used to... I can't remember what it was called, but it was some kind of kids' programme I watched in the 70s. But there we go. Anyway, we digress. It's a very serious matter at hand, and uh, that's what I wish to address. So, um I think it's really, really good that we drill down, obviously, very carefully onto this contract. We've clearly got to be honest with public sector partners, i.e. town and parish councils, as to the funds that we do have. But I think, I think something we'd all agree on, if you drive around not just this district, but the other boroughs within the area, um, the public realm looks tatty. Uh, and my worry is, is that we need to select a contractor 
um, that if we can, if there is capacity and we ask them to do specific projects outside of what we're, what's in front of us today, I mean, Deborah's rem remarked upon it, but there are clear areas where um, we've either put the wrong plants in before, where there's bramble problems, massive bramble overgrowth in a, in a, in, in a lot of areas. Um, I think we've all seen that. Um, and indeed, um, the, the major bone of contention for me as a avid gardener is the fact that we've seen such horrendous ash die back in this area, and we have lost a huge number of trees, not just to ash die back, but also to the fact that woodlands aren't managed as well as they were 30 years ago. There's no doubt about it. You, you, when I was a child, you didn't, you didn't, well, you didn't drive it around as a child, but as a passenger, you didn't see, um, you know, fallen trees everywhere and a complete mess in woodlands at the side of the road. And indeed, um, you know, trees in the public realm were a strong feature. Um, and we've we've removed trees. We haven't replaced them. So I have to say I was a green conservative before David Cameron even thought of the idea. And um, I, I just think that we we'd want to see a contract where we can bolt on projects and that and that contractor has the capacity to deliver on those projects. And I guess my follow on from that, not only if we were to ask a contractor to do more, if there was a specific project, for example, there might be in future government money in terms of tree planting, because I, I don't think across all of the political parties, and I'd include the Greens amongst them, that we've been you know, quite aggressive enough on this issue of ash dieback, because in this area it has been, and is absolutely horrendous. Um, and we need to plant the right trees in the right places. That's that's the bottom line. Um, and it's not just about seasonal planters. And um, it, there's a bigger picture here. And it's it's I, I don't couch it under global warming. My, my my specific point is we've seen the public realm getting tattier and tattier for decades. And we, we need to do what we can, despite the finances we have to improve that. And clearly to do that, we're going to need some external funding. But the other thing I just wanted to add in um, is is to ask Deborah if, if the, you, she thinks that the contractor will have the capacity, if asked by a town or parish council, to do a particular project. Because we've heard it many times before, and, in turn, and I know that parish councils and town councils love to keep business local and select a local contractor. But if they have the option... If they have an option of a of a contractor that they can see is doing a good job for the district council, it would be just nice to know that that contractor can also service a parish and town council, not on a not on a maintenance basis, but on a basis around some specific projects that town and parish councils may have to improve the public realm. Thank you very much indeed, Jim. Deborah, you can answer. Yes, th thank you for that, councillor. Thank you, chair. Um, <laughs> Obviously, any contractor would welcome the opportunity to earn more, more from a contract, but we are bound by procurement rules, um, as I mentioned in, in, in my speech or piece earlier on. So, um, presuming it fits in with the procurement rules, then we would obviously seek to support any other project work that came along, um, presuming there was financing for it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Sorry about that. It occurred to me that with concerns for a lack of pollination uh, and pollinating insects, that whether we could include um, pollinating, uh, encouraging um, plants in this contract. To, to help and to be attractive, and whether or not we could include local horticultural societies in, 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 in the, this. I mean, we're possibly thinking of a grounds maintenance contract, but perhaps we should think of it as a, an environmental development um, process. And, uh, that. and I would just like to say that I agree that over the last sort of 10 to 12 years, the public realm has really, really been coming more and more Tatty. I don't know why, but it certainly is. Rather long. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cook. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I just declare myself as chairman of Battletown Council, a very proud chairman, because in battle we have um, an amazing group of people called the Beautiful Battle Group, and we also have another group called Wild About Battle, and Battletown Council does actually provide them with some funding so they can buy plants or we buy the plants on their behalf and bulbs which they then plant in and around our town. We're even more fortunate that our own ground staff will go around and water them when necessary. So I do think that this is something that town councils can take on because then they can maintain them at their own budget limits um, which you know, and I know that Bexhill also has a very good, beautiful Bexhill group. And I think, you know, that they are the kind of people that we're looking to, aren't they, Deborah? We're looking to them <coughs> to take on some of these roles. Thank you. No, I'm just aware that time is cracking on and we'll be up to limit. So we've, we've got to come up with a decision. Um, so I'm going to ask Councillor Tim, as you sat here for two and a half hours, waiting to say something, and this is your portfolio, so, so Hazel, over to you. Yeah, like Deborah, everything in my portfolio is having cuts. Um, I, I think it's really important to look at this um, as an overall decision that we have to make, uh, um, given our, our deficit. Um, but speaking for Bexhill Town Council, I haven't been a town councillor very long, but I have heard some very encouraging um, discussions and subjects on agendas about parks and gardens within Bexhill. So um, that particular town council is very eager to, uh, to take it on, I believe. I know that it's a long, drawn-out process. So, um, but um, our residents are going to see a huge difference um, unless the town councils do step up and the parishes, and I, I'm sure they will. But um, as Deborah says, this is a very difficult um, decision, but one that has to be made. Thank you, Chair. Right, Ben, do you want to finish off? Thank you. I think, I think most of what, we, what needs to be said has sort of been drawn out, and I think Hazel's, sorry, Councillor Timpey's really sort of drawn that to a close quite nicely. It is just about looking at this in the context of the discussions we had earlier. Um, around that Fit for the Future programme and Duncan's report about our, our current existing deficit. I would say that there, there is one key overriding opportunity that exists within the grounds maintenance, which is there is a local solution that can be brought forward. That is not something that we might have the opportunity to say about other choices that need to be made into the future. So given the fact that there, there is opportunities for voluntary groups working through town and parish councils to really come forward and help help deliver some of these services that we can no longer afford to do so. I think it's really important that those, those local solutions come from local people, and that's a real opportunity that we have in this one. So just thank you for listening on this one. I think, uh, I think um, we'll obviously report back as soon as we've undertaken the procurement. Right then. Well, I'll just remind you of what we've got to do here. Um, this committee is requested to review the draft contract specification as per Appendix 2. Subject to no suggested amendments, officers be authorised to commence the tender process without further recourse to Cabinet. I'm assuming the points that have been made, Deborah and team, have, have taken on board. Um, John? Just one footnote. Probably the single most disappointing appendix is that on woodlands. And I do think if we can find some way of working with local groups, because simply to regard woodlands as a source of danger uh, rather than something to be cherished, particularly at a time of uh, when really they are absorbing a huge amount of carbon, I, I genuinely think we should be writing into our contract some provision for working with voluntary groups around woodlands in particular. And I, I would recommend that change. Um, otherwise, I think we, we have to accept what is. Are you happy to take them to their points on? 
Yeah, I mean, if, if it's okay with members of the committee that we'd love to take them on as informal recommendations that we can drive forward. I think if we have any formal recommendations, that has to go back to the cabinet process, which would then delay the, the issuance of the, the specification. I think the key point for us is, are there any significant, like, sort of really damaging um, concerns? It feels like there's not, but I think we've taken really good notes tonight of, of those elements. And, and picking up on the woodlands bit, we'll, we'll look at how we can implement those going forwards if, if there's opportunities to do so. But you are right, and it's just if we can take that on as an informal recommendation, it, it helps keep the process quite slick. Yep. All right. Um, so, are you happy with that? Yep. Okay. Um, someone want to move the recommendation? Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Count, Councillor Burton, and move it as long as you take away glyphosate. Something like that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moved by Councillor Burton, seconded by Councillor Cook. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, right. Uh, what have we got now? Local enforcement plan. Page 105, item 10. Be it resolved that a local enforcement plan, task and finish group be established. In terms of reference, that Appendix 1 be approved together with indicative timescales for carrying out the review and reporting back and the size of the task and finish group be agreed and appointments made there too. You remember we sort of mentioned this before. Um, some time ago, Councillor Colleen brought it up originally. Um, then Kemi gave us a member briefing on enforcement, which was quite very interesting, actually. Um, then I spoke or emailed with Councillor Clean, who then left this committee and became the planning portfolio holder. Uh, and I was going to leave it with her to sort of liaise with Kemi and see if anything needed to happen. Uh, but then in the meantime, the Cabinet, I think this came from Cabinet, didn't it? This, I'm sure this request came from Cabinet. It did. Um, for me to put this on the agenda and get a task and finish group. So, but there we are. Um, Kemi, anything you wanted to add? Um, sorry, this was in my introduction, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> that was all I had on my list, on my short, uh, short presentation to say, and you've said it all, so... Um, with the exception to just saying that uh, the desired outcome is in is written on the page 105 of the report, uh, para, para point three of that of that page. So, okay, All right. Um, well, on from that then. Well, ah, oh, you can't move it yet. I've got to give names out first. Um, <laughs> right. I have had interest on this. Brian Drayson, Councillor Drayson, emailed me literally during the Cabinet meeting <laughs> some weeks ago and said, please, I need to be considered for this. He is the chairman of the planning committee, so I don't know if that puts a spare in the words, but at least he knows what he's talking about. Um, Reassuringly, the planning committee has no oversight on enforcement. Right. Yeah. Right on. So I have Councillor Drayson, uh, Councillor Jimmy Stranger. Uh, Councillor Andrew Meir, who, given his unfortunate position with his partner, may have difficulty, but I'll keep him on the list. Um, Councillor Tony Biggs, Councillor Eleanor Kirby Green, um, Mary, and Mark. So seven. that's seven. So we want five or six, bearing in mind that Councillor Meir may struggle. Keep with that. And then we've... Pardon? Oh, I don't know. We can increase the membership. We can increase the membership. And, I, and, and to be honest, not everybody always turns up. You know, time, time scales and everything else. Councillor Cook? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you want to include um, Councillor Mia, I'm happy to stand in for him until such time as he can join the group. 
Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking we've got we've got seven names here. We only need five or six. So I don't. No, no, not necessarily. I, I, he he asked me the early on as well. I, I prefer to keep them in. If he says, "Well, I can't do it," then then we haven't got to worry about it. We have still got six. Yeah. Okay, everybody's happy with that. Agree seven names. Agree seven. Agree, agree the seven names, and and if one or two drop out, it's not the end of the world, is it? Agreed. Okay, Toby. Happy with that? Good. John's moved it. Who wants to second it? Councillor oh. Cook seconded it. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's the terms of reference. Um, yeah, if Kimmy's written them, then they must be right, don't they? <laughs> 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 Who am I to argue? Um, yeah, good. Happy with that? Yep. Yeah. Good. Right. Um, last item. Thanks, Kemi. Um, last item, item 11. I've got a note here from Jeff Pyra. Item 11 work programme. Add the High World National Landscape AONB Management Plan Report to the 22nd of April 2024 meeting. He's away, isn't he? Mm. He just sends them. He just sends off. Right, all right. Um, oh yeah, as Julie says, we got quite a lump there. Um, would, that be, would that be much of a thing? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think the problem is um, Jeff will have a tight timetable on the local plan. So I think probably we do need to do it, even if it's a hefty agenda. All right, yeah, we we'll do that. We're, the impact of Airbnb and second homes in Canberra, Ryan, Winchelsea, we we'll move that to June. June. Yeah, that looks a bit better. I don't think two months is going to make any odds, is it? No. We're probably booked up by now anyway. <laughs> right, okay, we do that and then we have the high world meeting for Jeff in April. Yep, John. I would have thought when we come to the third of June meeting uh, that it would certainly be very useful to take uh, the health and wellbeing report with the state of the district. And it might be the LSP is another one which would sit quite nicely there. But certainly health and well-being, which is an important part of our work, um, I think would sit quite nicely with the state of the district. Good. Right on. Okay, we saw it. Um, 20 past nine. Thank you very much for your attendance. I'll attend. I'll declare this meeting closed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the members online. Thank you. Good night.